Are we ready? Or You ready? Medford School Committee regular meeting February 3rd, 2020 in the Council Chambers, 7 p.m. Roll call vote, Madam Secretary. Member Grant? Present. Member Chris? Member McLaughlin? Yeah. Member Mastone? Yeah. Member Rousseau? Present. Member Vanderkloot present. Mayor Luongo Kern? Present. All please rise to salute our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Approval of the minutes of January 13, 2020. Motion to approve by Member Rousseau, seconded by Member Kretz. Roll call vote. Member Graham? Yes. Member Kretz? Yes. Member McLaughlin? Yes. Member Mastone? Yes. Member Rousseau? Yes. Member Vanderkloot? Pre uh, yes. Uh, Mayor Luongo Kern? Yes. Seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative. Minutes are approved. Approval, approval of bills, transfer of funds, and approval of payrolls. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Member Rousseau. Second. Seconded by Member Graham. Roll call vote. Member Graham? Yes. Member Kretz? Yes. Member McLaughlin? Yes. Member Mastone? Yes. Member Rousseau? Yes. Member Vanderkloot? Yes. Mayor Luongo Kern? Yes. Member Kretz? Oh, yes. Um, I just have a question, and, um, you know, I just, I'm familiar with the, um, with the report and re the reimbursement process. I just wanted to um, explain to the, the new committee members, and maybe, Christine, if you could explain, Ms. Patterson, um, how a teacher or administrator submits a reimbursement, like what's required um, in order for them to get reimbursed, and do they get full reimbursement? Certainly. Mm -hmm. So for any... Uh Anybody to be paid or reimbursed through the city, we require a W-9 for them to be established as a vendor. Um, they would not be submitting or receiving a 1099. It would be documented that this is for reimbursement. Uh, we do discourage um, initial purchases that would include any sales tax. We cannot reimburse sales tax. So that is, um, and, and meals tax, but that's uh, not usually what is submitted. But per Mass General Law, we are an exempt entity, so therefore we cannot reimburse for tax. So we highly encourage everybody to utilize the purchase order system mm -hmm. in order to request the goods or materials that they need or contracted service so that they are not, number one, putting out any of their own funds, and mm -hmm. number two, so that they're is um, a full re reimbursement as mm -hmm. needed. Thank you. Thank you. Prior to the report of secretary, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules for the purposes of uh, discussing a proclamation to make Medford hunger free and also to move up community participation. Hunger free pledge. I know we have um, Sarah McGiven and Carol present, and I will read the proclamation to make Medford hunger free. Whereas Hunger and poverty are issues of grave concern in the United States, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the city of Medford. 
or as Medford is committed to educating people about food insecurity and the importance of food banks in alleviating hunger in our communities, whereas food insecurity is a persistent and significant reality in Medford where one in 10 people, one in eight children, and one in 14 seniors do not know where the next meal will come from, whereas the Greater Boston Food Bank and its member agencies provide vital hunger relief services to our most vulnerable neighbors, whereas Medford shall work with hunger relief organizations to make Eastern Massachusetts hunger free by supporting access to three healthy meals a day for our residents in need. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Medford School Committee does hereby proclaim no later than January 1, 2028, Medford will be hunger free and urge all the residents of Medford to take note of this proclamation and participate fittingly in achieving this important goal and an advisory committee shall be created to provide specific recommendations for achieving this goal with, a, with, with appointments for one year to include at least a teacher, school administrator, nursing representative, adjustment counselor, food services representative, and three school committee members. The advisory committee shall provide at least an interim status report within six months of their first meeting and provide a final report to the school committee prior to the end of the one year term of this advisory committee given at the City Hall in Medford, Massachusetts, this third day of, in February in the year 2020. Okay. Honorable Mayor, Dr. Edward Vincent, honorable members of the school committee. My name is Carol Tinkin. I am a Medford resident. I live at 261 Governors Avenue. I am also the chief operating officer and the senior vice president of distribution services at the Greater Boston Food Bank. I am here to commend the city of Medford on this bold step that it's taking to stand up and take leadership to end hunger in Medford and hopefully lead other cities and towns in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to do the same and take the same step. We all know that children in particular cannot function, cannot think, cannot act without decent food. Their families cannot support them either without good support and uh, good food and healthy food and nutritious food uh, every day and have access. We also want to thank and commend the City of Medford for the Food Security Task Force that it created. The Greater Boston Food Bank has been doing this work for two and a half years, and I want to share that we have seen um, Medford go from the third most underserved community in eastern Massachusetts by 36 percent, meaning that they only were processing about one meal a day in the City of Medford to now being all over 70 percent in less than a year. We believe we can continue to close this gap uh, we want to thank Project Bread, uh, our colleagues. We also want to thank the, universe, uh, the Universalists, the Unitarian Universalists, sorry, St. Ray's and St. Francis for the work that they've done. And we also, I, I, I would be remiss in not recognizing members of the school committee, especially Mia Mastone, who's been working with us very closely during this time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. YMCA, YMCA. Oh, the YMCA in Malden, sorry. Yes, YMCA is great. Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah McGivern, uh, 63 Watervale Road. I'm the Mass and Motion Coordinator in the Board of Health, and I'm the coordinator of the Medford Food Security Task Force. Um, we convened about two years ago because we saw that there was need for different entities in the community to work together and to have common goals on getting our city hunger free. Um, just past two years, it's been amazing. We um, actually just published this food plan about two months ago, and I'm going to pass it around. Short versions of it. I, there's not enough for everyone, but I encourage you to share with me. Um, there are some some recommendations in there um, for what we can do to work on getting our city to become hunger free. Um, I think this year is going to be a really great year of action. We've been doing planning, and now we're we're going to be taking steps to really eradicate hunger. Um, there's already a lot of action taking place, but it's going to be a unified. Uh, group effort. Um, I guess don't have anything else to say. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Member McLaughlin. Um, I wanted to thank you and uh, Mia for introducing me to the Food Security Task Force and uh, Shira and Carol and um, Sarah Kluggish and all of the folks in Medford who are working on this really important issue. I learned two very important um, things from the Food Security Task Force when I attended their meeting. And um, one was that uh, I said, you know, why don't you just call it hunger? 
Um, and you know, why do you keep calling it food insecurity? What does that actually mean? And um, they shared with me that uh, we're all hungry um, every day. But food insecurity is very different than being hungry. Hungry, we know when we're next, our, our next meal is coming. Food insecurity is when you don't know where your next meal is coming from and how you'll get it. Um, and that really stood out to me. And also uh, where they were sharing the uh, one in nine Medford households um, experience food insecurity. And one of the things that the food um, task force really wanted to work on was destigmatizing uh, food insecurity because uh, often it's the case that we know people that are experiencing food insecurity and they're not sharing that with us because of the stigma attached to um, having food insecurity and being hungry. So I really applaud uh, the work of the Food Security Task Force and um, thank you Mia and all for bringing it forward and I would encourage community members to attend the meetings and uh, get involved as much as you can because I know that none of us want to see a child hungry. Thank you. Thank you. Member Van de Kloot. Just want to say thank you to all those involved. This is a great thing, and um, I motion for approval. Member Rousseau. I'll second the motion, um, and I also wanted to add that I uh, look forward to the advisory committee. Um, I've been pretty vocal on this uh, proclamation that um, as much as the proclamation feels good, the proclamation won't help anybody um, with their food insecurity. So it's important that we have actions coming out of this. Um, and I look forward to hopefully being part of this advisory committee uh, to figure out what we can do in our schools, understanding what it would cost, and really making sure that we are closing the gap as needed here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, motion for approval by Member Van de Kloot, seconded by Member Rousseau. Member Van I'll vote, please. A roll call vote has been requested. <coughs> Member Graham. Member Kretz? Yes. Member McLaughlin? Yes. Member Mastone? Yes. Member Rousteau? Yes. <laughs> uh, Member Vanderkloot? Yes. Mayor Luongo Kern? Yes. Seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative. The paper passes. This proclamation will now go to the City Council tomorrow night and hopefully as one unified. Um, <laughs> While we're into suspension, Member Van de Kloot, resolution number five, as well as participation from um, our students that we have here. Is that correct? Be it resolved that the Medford, uh, this is offered by myself um, with regards to the minimum wage question that a number of us have been asked. Be it resolved that the school committee hold a committee of the whole meeting to discuss minimum wage for all employees. It further resolved that the administration provide the school committee with a list of all who do not receive minimum wage and what the cost per year would be to make that change. Um, I know there are a number of people that want to speak on that, so we'll open up the floor to you, and hopefully within the next 30 to 40 days, we will hold a committee of the whole to get out all, all the facts and figures before us, as well as the law. Hello, my name is Brenna Christensen. I'm a senior at Medford High School and I've had the wonderful opportunity to work at the Brooks After School Program for two years. I want to thank the mayor, the superintendent, assistant superintendent, and school committee members for listening to our concerns regarding our wages. Working at the Brooks After School Program is truly my favorite part of the day. I've had the pleasure of working there and grew such a strong bond with my coworkers and the students. As a high school assistant, we are the ones who fill in for when group leaders are out sick, or when there is a day where the program is severely understaffed. I have missed countless practices, school events, and more because I knew how badly understaffed work was and how desperately they needed our help. As a Mustang, I've always been told that when there's a concern or an issue, to use your voice. When the high school after school workers and I had been continuously given dismissive answers to our minimum wage questions, it was clear that we were getting taken advantage of and it was time to come together and raise our concerns. Because there is no after-school union, us teams have formed our own group to work together to try and seek a resolution. The Medford Public School System should be proud that they have taught us to ask questions, seek clarification, and to stand up for what is right. As I know how much the after-school program means to the city, transparency and fair wages within our job means as much to us. Myself, along with many of my coworkers, will be heading off to college soon, and I want to make this important job, one that I love so much, fair to those who will eventually take my place. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sawang Anza, and I'm a senior at Medford High School. I, along with Brenna, started working at the Brooks After School in September of 2018. 
When many of us first started working at the after school, we were making $11 an hour, which was the minimum wage at the time. We were told when we took the job that we would be getting paid minimum wage, and none of us had any idea that our wage would not rise when the minimum wage increased in January of 2019. We made repeated inquiries during the 2019 year, but it seemed like no one had answers to give us. In retrospect, it seems like everyone has take, was taking advantage of the fact that we were kids and unwilling to question authority. Finally, the issue of our pay was brought up at the November 18, 2019 school committee meeting, which many of you took issue with. Mayor Burke then went on record saying that as of January 2020, we must be paid $13 an hour. We were overjoyed to hear this, and many of us did not raise the issue further, assuming that our wages would increase, as was promised to us. Now that it is 2020 and our wages have not increased, um, many of us have had enough. We keep getting told to wait or to consider how expensive it is to increase our wages and that everyone is on our side, despite the fact that this issue has been going on for over a year. At the end of the day, it is not fair that we are doing our, a job that the city needs us to do and we are not getting compensated fairly for it. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Rachel Klein and I'm also a senior. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. As previously mentioned, the after school aides waited for a year to get any response back about our situation. It is only now that we were told that Medford is supposedly exempt from minimum wage law because of section 454 27.06 in the Code of Massachusetts regulations. If Medford is exempt, this is something that we should have been told the minute our wages stopped corresponding with the minimum wage um, but we were only told this two weeks ago. The law states that to be exempt from minimum wage law, the city needs to have a waiver from the state. When we were told this, we asked to see that certificate. We still have not seen it. So we're gonna ask again today to, uh, that you guys produce the certificate without delay. But at the end of the day, this is more than about just the law. This is about fundamental fairness. Over the course of the past year, representat representations were continually made to us that the wage issue would be taken care of, culminating at that school committee meeting in November where we were promised to get $13 an hour for our work. Many of you went on record taking issue with the situation at the after school. We work hard in the after school every day and we are an essential part of the program. We often come in at a moment's notice because the program is short staffed on that particular day yet we still continue to be undervalued and underpaid. We are performing a job that the city needs us to do, and we're giving up our free days to help make sure this program runs, and yet we are making less than minimum wage. We have patiently waited for over a year, only to be told at the 11th hour that the, city, or the program and the city are exempt from minimum wage. We had continued to work on this past year based on representations made to us that the wage issue was being taken care of. Um, in order to make this right, we deserve to be paid minimum wage going forward and to get retroactive pay um, starting from when the issue first began. We truly do want to reach a resolution quietly and as soon as possible, but going forward in this process, we need to be much more informed and involved with these decisions. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I hope we can work things out. Thank we you. also have a letter from a parent at the after school mm -hmm. who wanted to, who couldn't be here tonight. My name is Nancy Donlin. I'm one of the teachers at the high school. And I'm here because I'm familiar with the issue. Many, if not most, of the students involved in this, I'm familiar with. I've had them in class. I've taught in Medford for 19 years. They are, without question, the most intelligent, lovely, um, extremely valued young people that you could meet anywhere. And I'm, But I'm here because one of the students involved in this said last week that she wished she'd never signed the petition. And when I inquired about that, she said, I wish I never signed it because we're getting so much negativity directed to us by administrators, by faculty, by our fellow students. And quite honestly, uh, that upsets me to no end. These are young people that have, have really gone way out of their way to advocate for themselves. And as a teacher, 
I feel that that's one of my most primary responsibilities, to get my students to be able to advocate for themselves. Secondarily, the social studies curriculum is changing in a fundamental way to incorporate civics into the new instruction. We can't pick and choose what civic issues we think are important for our students to engage in and which ones aren't. If the advocacy that they take for themselves happens to be um, with language that we may feel is inappropriate or not quite at the, an adult or a professional level, they're young people. And our job is to teach them how to bring their ideas and how to bring their concerns to a place where they can engage civically and ultimately resolve the issue, perhaps to their advantage or not, but to, to, to really take those steps to advocate for themselves. It was very disheartening to hear a student say that I wished I never put my name to the petition because of the way in which we're being treated for our advocacy. I hope you very sincerely um, recognize and applaud the advocacy steps that they've taken, irregardless of how this issue is resolved. They are outstanding students. We all should be proud of them. And we should really applaud that they're doing the steps that we've taught them is in a, in a civil society as to how people resolve their issues. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Member Kretz. Uh, first, I have to disclose that my sister is, um, she works as an assistant group leader in the after school program, and I already completed a, dis a disclosure of appearance of conflict of interest form, and I submitted it with the city clerk's office um, last Thursday so I could speak this evening. Um, so I, after um, learning immediately after the school committee meeting in November, I heard from some students, um, and they had told me that they were they were still making the minimum wage, which was the $11 an hour. So I was a little confused because I thought that everybody was making above that, which was you know between the 12 and then going up to the 13. So I had sent a message off to the um, assistant superintendent's office, and she was uh, sorry, assistant superintendent of finance, and um, she was going to look into um, let's see, look into an option and explore a way that we can um, increase it in the budget level. And, um, you know, I just want to say, you know, that I really appreciate everything that you do in the after school program. I volunteered at the Brooks, the Roberts, and I've been to the McGlynn after school programs, and I've observed and participated and helped out in the program. And it's very well structured. There's a curriculum. It starts off with physical education, either inside or outside. Then everybody goes back indoors and, um, um, they're doing either story time in the younger groups, uh, arts and crafts, um, activities, then there's homework time, and then there's some free time. And I've spent the afternoon um, until it's, you know, pickup time with, this, with the classrooms that I've been in. Um, and it's just been a wonderful um, experience for me. And I've seen and see um, exactly um, what you do on the floor and in the schools uh, working with the students and how they look up to you as role models um, and how they really really appreciate that everything that you're doing and just that you're a student working with another student it's um it's just wonderful and you know seeing everything that you're doing in the program so I just wanted to say you know thank you and I am very proud of everything that you do in the program and for coming out here tonight and advocating for the uh, after school program thank you member McLaughlin thank the students for coming out tonight and their um, family and um, and say that I'm proud of you for your self-advocacy skills. Um, advocating and getting up in a microphone with lots of people looking at you in a whole room full of uh, adults can be intimidating and um, it's really teach, shows us all something that Medford should be proud of, teaching you all to do this. And we appreciate that you came out in front of everybody to do that. Um, if I understood what you were saying correctly, um, you were looking for uh, the retroactive for the $13 an hour that the mayor had, um, mayor, previous mayor, Mayor Burke, had uh, suggested in January 2020 would be um, the current rate and uh, a waiver of the certificate that you are wanting to see. Um, I think those were the three items I wanted to clarify on that. And then also um, 
wanted to make sure, uh, Mayor Kern, that the students know what a committee of the whole meeting is. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, I don't know if you want to explain that so that they could understand and um, that if you're interested in participating, that's a public meeting and something that uh, you, a lot of get, you get to see a lot of what happens behind the scenes in those meetings and it's, they're good to come to to learn more as well. Committee of the whole meeting is a meeting that we have that isn't so formal. Um, it, it, sometimes there, this, we had one today at 5.30. It was tel that one was televised. This may be a little bit different. We we're talking about personnel, so we may have to go into executive session where we have to speak about personnel um, matters behind closed doors, but we can reconvene after we figure things out and make a full report, whether it's that night or after that night, letting, uh, letting the public know what facts and figures, um, anything that's public, we can release that after, afterwards. Um, also, I know this may affect other positions in the budget, so we really need to um, give our finance department a little, just to, even if it's a couple weeks, just to get facts and figures before us so that we have the, the answers to the questions we're all gonna have in committee of the whole meeting. Um, I think, I think two, two weeks, Maybe um, Ms. Patterson can enlighten us on how long that might take t just to make sure we know every single position that will be affected, how many we have in that position, just like my motion reads. Um, so I would hope within two weeks. Point of clarification, then. Mm -hmm. so the, um, committee of the whole meeting, so point of clarification, the committee of the whole meeting is actually going to be an executive committee meeting, not a committee of the whole meeting. Not necessarily, but if we're going to talk about um, different people in different positions, then yes, parts of it would have to go into executive session. But then the other parts are We can open. just, yep, mm -hmm. whatever okay. has to go into exec executive session, whether that's five, 10, 20 minutes to an hour, and then you can open it up to the, the general public. Member Van de Kloot. Yes, I think my colleagues have summed up uh, many of the discussion points, but I, I feel particularly disheartened to hear from Ms. Donlin that um, any student felt uh, that they were getting negative feedback because of this. And I just want to say and add my voice that I applaud you for coming forward and for advocating for yourself. That is exactly what we want you to do. And we're appreciative of your uh, time and presence here this evening. Thank you. Member Graham. Um, I mostly echo what Paulette had to say. And I think one of the hardest things about advocacy is it takes a lot of personal conviction, and I think you guys all quite clearly have that level of personal conviction. So regardless of what anybody says to you or what the answer is, I think the, the cornerstone of advocacy is that if you believe in what you're advocating for, um, don't let anybody tell you differently. So please keep doing what you're doing. We've clearly taught you well. Um, and I would also say that it, there's lots of ways to feel regret and to feel like you're getting messages. And some of those feelings can come from unspoken com comments or you know, unspoken uh, body language. And others can come from actual direct communication that has made you feel that way. And what I would encourage you all to do is that if there are things being directly spoken to you that make you feel like you are being penalized, I would ask you to think about coming forward to either Superintendent Edward Vincent um, or Superintendent Diane Caldwell, Assistant Superintendent Diane Caldwell, and to make sure that they understand where that's coming from so that if there is a systemic issue, we can address it. Member Rousseau. Yes. I just would like to um, quickly point out though that when we have our committee of the whole the the only moment we will be talking in executive session is when we are discussing something that is allowed and we will not also talk about other stuff um, that's a really important point we can't go into executive session to discuss employees that perhaps are under a contract and then also talk about employees that are not under a contract we have to literally divide our conversation very clearly, so there won't be any like, you come into the room, we're talking, we're gonna to go to executive session, and we come out and we've talked about you or what this is, th this topic. So um, it's really important to note that executive session has very strict rules that we have to always kind of, you know, enforce with each other, like, no, you can't talk about that. Um, we really do that because 
the law is very explicit about what we can and cannot talk about in those meetings. Um, so I do think the Committee of the Whole, obviously I would uh, make a motion to approve this. And, um, but if we do have executive session portion, which we may have to have because if there's an effect on employees with a contract, we can't discuss that in the public, um, it won't be most of the meeting. You definitely want to stick around. Motion for approval by Member Rousseau, seconded by um, Member Kretz. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Would you like to speak? Oh, yeah. Su Superintendent? And I just want to um, address our students and say that, yes, we definitely, Medford Public Schools really um, endorses and believes strongly in leadership skills. Um, the teacher in me was listening to your persuasive arguments and how well written and how uh, wonderfully you all presented this evening. And again, advocacy is truly important. It's an important skill that we want to continue to develop in all of our students. And again, we will take everything that was said this evening and the previous meetings that have already taken place um, and moving forward with the future Committee of the Whole to truly reflect on everything and um, you know, address many of the concerns that were said this morning. So I do not want anyone leaving here thinking that we do not support and encourage um, student advocacy and leadership skills. And um, that is definitely a strong skill set that is developed in Medford. And I want to see more of that skill set um, developed. I also want to thank Ms. Donlin for um, sharing and also being a courageous teacher to come up and share with us this evening, um, you know, her thoughts and the information that she had. So thank you. And thank you to parents for supporting their children. Um, this is wonderful family, community, and engagement. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Member McLaughlin. Uh, just another point of clarification. I'm wondering how the students will uh, be informed of the committee of the whole meeting date. Um, they are posted online, but that means you have to go and look and check online. Is there a way that we can push information to the students into the after school program? About the date? Um, once it's scheduled, yes. I can actually work with Ms. Donlin as well. Thank you. Thank you. Member Vanderkloot? Yes. Uh, while we heard from students involved in the after school program, we have other students who work for us. And it would only be equitable to understand the full breadth of um, student employees. For instance, we have students who are lifeguards. Uh, and yeah, I don't that's part of the motion that, is okay. that all those paid under minimum wage, we get a tally of that, how much mm -hmm. that's going to cost to increase. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Motion for approval has been passed. Motion for approval. Is that Emily? Okay, thanks. While we're under suspension, we have Tony Ray in the audience. For an update from the nursing department. information coming out of the um, Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the CDC around the coronavirus. Um, I have some handouts. Okay. We are continuing to monitor this information very closely. Um, this morning, Mary Ann O'Connor, who is the director of the Medford Board of Health, Janet Leahy, who is a public health nurse, and myself participated in a teleconference with the officials from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. At this time, they informed us that the risk for Massachusetts citizens to become ill with the coronavirus is very low. What we learned from this teleconference this morning the CDC is conducting screening for illness among pas passengers who are traveling from China to the United States at 11 designated airports. Travelers who are arriving from the Hubei province will be screened and subject to mandatory qu quarantine for 14 days. Federal officials are advising travelers who arrive from mainland China to the United States anytime after February 2nd, which was yesterday, 
to self-quarantine at home for 14 days. Thank you. The CDC is monitoring this rapidly changing situation, and they provide regular updates um, through their websites and also to local public health authorities um, across the nation. There are two links um, to uh, information that I gave you. Um, both of them are the handouts. One of them is the novel coronavirus and you, which provides um, information about the virus and how you can help prevent it, as well as um, what should the public do, which um, has some very concrete steps to, uh, for pu the public to use to avoid um, getting um, the, the virus. At this time, I have to mention that this is also influenza season, so um, we are seeing a lot of influenza-like illness in our schools and in the community. Um, school nurses are closely monitoring symptoms from students and reminding parents to keep children home if they are um, symptomatic with a fever um, and other signs of influenza. We're also asking people to practice good hand washing to, and cough um, techniques, and these are being enforced with the students in school by the school nurses. Any students who are ill, um, such as having a fever or symptoms, are, are being sent home as a way to contain the infection in the community. We want to remind you that students can return to school once they're fever-free for 24 hours without medication, and as well that it, there's still time to get a flu vaccine. We also want to reassure you that um, we are monitoring this situation very closely and staying informed of, the informed of the latest recommendations out of our public health authorities. And we will continue to share this with you as it unfolds um, to us. Thank you. Member Rousseau. Thank you for that report. I really do appreciate it. Um, if somebody is identified as needing quarantine, I presume, or self-quarantine, um, is Medford notified of, that this is a resident? No. No. Not, not to my knowledge, no. Medford meaning? I mean, does the town, wherever the person lives, they get off the, the plane and they are identified as somebody who does need to be self-quarantine? Um, Maybe I, I don't understand self-quarantine then. Right. Well, they're, they're being given um, handouts from the CDC screeners at the airports um, that um, outlines the, the steps to be taken and explains what that is. Um, I probably shouldn't have jumped to say no that they're not notified. I, I don't think the this, this board, local boards of health are notified of those who are self-quarantining because um, most of those people um, may be coming from that region, but they may be likely asymptomatic. And so, but when somebody is quarantined because they're symptomatic. That's uh, different. They don't get to go home. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. At, at the airports, they're quarantining them on military bases and those type of facilities. Okay. Thank you. Member McLaughlin. Thank you for your report. You're welcome. Tony. Um, I had a question on the uh, communication that you sent out where it says federal officials are advising travelers who arrive in the U.S. after February 2nd from mainland China to self-quarantine at home for 14 days. So mm -hmm. this is getting to Member Rousseau's point about the self-quarantine. Um, so do, do we have any mechanism in our school to understand if we have uh, school community members that have traveled to China in the past 14 days? If, if, um Yes, if, um, if parents have reported to their administration that they are, you know, away for a vacation, um, this is a, tip, a really typical time for Chinese families to return um, for Chinese New Year. That's, mm -hmm. um, and we have people who may be over there on business. I mean, there's many different reasons people are tra you know, travel to China. Um, sometimes we do, you know, we are aware of that. Um, so we're doing our best to work with those families and provide education so that they understand what constitutes um, symptomatic and what all of these um, recommendations mean. And if I understand the, the um, correspondence, though, it's whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic that they're recommending a 14-day self-quarantine. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Right, asymptomatic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, but there's no real enforcement of it. Is that accurate? Um, 
Those that we that we are aware of, yes, we're we're monitoring. We're you know we're watching that they're staying home. I mean, we're doing the best we can. Sure, of course. But I mean, there's no from from the um, public health officials or anything like that. There's no way to track or enforce or anything like that, right? Not to my knowledge. Marianne O'Connor still here? No, no. And and is this more significant? I don't know. I haven't been watching it all on the news because um, sometimes I feel like there's there can be elements of hysteria to these things too but is there are there, a lot of elements to yeah. hysteria is this different from a typical flu actually you're at more risk of contracting the flu right now than you are of contracting coronavirus okay especially influenza B that seems to be what is being um, cultured out with people who are symptomatic with, Ill, um, with flu-like illness symptoms. Um, you're much more at risk of that, and more, more people in the United States die of influenza than mm -hmm. people who have died of coronavirus. Thank you. That helps, I think, with a mm -hmm. little bit, perhaps, with the hysteria piece of it. Yes. And then is the symptomatic, uh, are the symptoms, you know, more severe than the average flu, or? They, they tend to be lower respiratory symptoms, so um, a deep cough, shortness of breath, chest pain which is often a, a little bit different than flu. Flu, you'll have the cough, a cough sneezing, the body aches, the fever, um, but the lower respiratory symptoms seem to be what um, delineate this from other uh, respiratory illnesses. Thank you so much for your expertise. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. M motion to receive and place on file. I, okay, thank you. Member Graham. Oh, can I just ask one more question before you leave the microphone? <laughs> Maybe two. Um, Sorry. Is Logan one of the 11 designated airports? No. Okay. And for those um, families who are returning that we're aware of, I mm -hmm. think what I heard you say, and I just want to make sure I understand, mm -hmm. is you're attempting to get in touch with those families, mm -hmm. making sure they're aware of the federal recommendation that mm -hmm. they self-quarantine, mm -hmm. um, but they can choose not to, um, and they can choose to send their children to school. Is that what I heard and um, yes and and the the word we had from this phone this teleconference this morning is um, for for children that who are symptomatic um, asymptomatic excuse me there are no restrictions on their activity so people are being voluntarily you know asked to voluntary self self quarantine and so um, so there's many other communities across the Commonwealth that um, are in a similar situation as we are. And are they all sort of approaching this the same way, which is, it sounds like, to make sure the families are aware of the recommendation and mm -hmm. then the families make that decision we're, we're to all, either send or not? We're all, we're all trying to transmit the same message that's coming from the CDC and the board of, local boards of health. And do you have any um, words of comfort, maybe, to offer the, the community that has not traveled to China but hears about, back to the hysteria, but, he, but hears about um, students returning from China who may be attending school, um, whether that's parents of students or staff or administrators? I, I think what's helpful is, when, when, is looking at when families have returned. Um, because the, the CDC has designated February 2nd as the date for the quarantines to start. Um, the further um, backwards that you came into the country from February 2nd, let's say you came in mid-January or early January, those, those people are less likely. Their risk of contracting that disease was very low compared to people who are coming, maybe coming in after February 2nd. There's more disease in China right now, um, and it has been, you know, slowly increasing da daily. So if you came in three weeks ago, two weeks ago, one week ago, the risk of your infection was less. Thank you. Motion to receive in place on file by Member Van Kloot, seconded by Member McLaughlin. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion to revert back to the regular order of business okay. by okay. Member Van de Kloot, report of secretary. Hi. Uh, I have several things to bring to your attention. Um, at our last school committee meeting, uh, Member McLaughlin uh, asked, and it was reflected in our minutes, uh, about uh, the 
uh, conversations with non-English speaking families uh, from the from the health office and we talked about a translation service uh, that were used. So I pulled uh, one of the, the bills so that you could see it. I want to note that the names that are on it are not student names. They are in fact the employees. But I thought you would just be interested. You can see that sometimes the conference is only uh, two minutes and sometimes it's 14 minutes. Uh, but this is that we um, uh, employ a service to help with the translation. So I brought that in. I'm going to pass them around and I would ask that they all, they are copies, but if you just return them to me, I'd appreciate it. Secondarily, and this is kind of a, an ode to my former colleague, our former colleague, Erin De Benedetto, I wanted to, um, I pulled a, uh, a bill that was for professional cleaning. Uh, whenever I see professional odor rede remediation services, that piqued my interest, so I followed it up. It had to do with the Curtis Tufts. Um, they had a problem in uh, the library classroom. Um, so on December 26th, when it was uh, students were not in the building, uh, they brought in ServPro to help remediate that issue. And so you'll see uh, that, that bill. Lastly, I just thought you might be interested that we have received new textbooks for our students for our civic education in grade seven. Um, and I brought in the bills for you to see that. Unfortunately, much to my dismay, I realized that they are already out of date as I couldn't help but look under impeach and it mentioned that uh, only you know two presidents have been impeached. And so we are obviously, our teachers are going to have to update up, uh, that information, but there is also a teacher. So I brought them in just so you could see and know that these um, resources have been brought to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Motion for approval of the report. Place on file. Motion to receive and place on file by Member Van de Kloot, seconded by Member Kretz. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion is received and placed on file. One further thing. Um, I just want to extend again an invitation to any other member. Uh, I've been getting there on Wednesdays about 10.15. Uh, and if anybody does want to join me, if you give me a heads up, then I'll make sure my, my timing's more exact. But uh, please do feel free to come and join on Wednesdays up at the uh, high school. Thank, Thank you. you. We have um, community participation. Hearing and seeing none. <coughs> Report of superintendent. Good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to announce that last Friday, the Medford Public Schools unveiled its brand new website. The former website was developed in 2007. Over the course of the past two years, Allison Goldsberry, our webmaster, has been very busy diligently researching other school system websites, discussing what works as well as what doesn't work with different focus groups, which included staff, parents, and students. She worked both with Tufts University students and our own vocational media students to put together a comprehensive, more visual, and user-friendly site. As we are all aware, a website is a constant work in progress, but we feel the new site is very welcoming and helps to address many more of our needs. We encourage everyone to visit it and let us know what you think. I'd like to thank Allison Goldsberry, our webmaster, Tufts University students, and our own vocational media technology students for all of their time, hard work, efforts in updating the new website. As we just heard, I wanna just highlight again the important health update on coronavirus, and I wanna just thank our nursing director, Tony Ray, Supervisor of Health Services for Metro Public Schools for presenting that timely information to the community this evening. Additionally, I want to recognize um, Team Medford, Marianne O'Connor, and um, I know Chief, your Chief of Staff, Mr. Rodriguez, and um, the Nursing Director here, Janet Leahy, for working collaboratively with Medford Public Schools to come up with a an official formal uh, response as a city. 
Moving along, I want to recognize some of our CCSR students at the McGlynn Middle School. McGlynn Middle School was recently featured on Channel 4. The program, the Look Up Challenge, does just that. It challenges students to put down their phones and head out to play, read a good book, or just have a conversation with family and friends. Look Up Live is a nonprofit startup whose mission is to support youth design solutions for technology and real life balance. Since before the holiday vacation, McGlynn Middle School students have been challenged to reflect upon how they can take a more balanced approach with their use of technology. In addition to that, this project was funded by the Cummings Foundation and the Crystal Campbell Community Betterment Fund. So we would like to thank them also for their continued support of Medford Public Schools. I also want to thank Brookline Bank and Members Plus Credit Union for their introduction to financial literacy. They presented to our eighth grade students at both the Andrews and McGlynn Middle Schools. The bankers presented very clear objectives. They engaged students in discussions on topics related to personal finance while making important connections with math in the classroom to their everyday lives. The bankers intend on making this an annual event. We appreciate their partnership with the Medford Public Schools. Later this evening, during our meeting tonight, Dr. Riccadelli will be explaining the middle school lottery process in detail. However, I wanted to just quickly share the schedule for informational meetings for fifth grade families, which I will host at each of our four elementary schools. The meetings will be posted on the blog and on our website, and fifth grade parents will also receive an invitation from their respective principal. The meeting schedule will be as follows. Tuesday, March 3rd, from 5.30 to 6.30, Brooks Elementary School in the library. Thursday, March 5th, from 5.30 to 6.30, Roberts Elementary School in the library. Tuesday, March 10th, from 5 to 6 o'clock, McGlynn Elementary School in the library. And also on Tuesday, March 10th, from 6.30 to 7.30, Columbus Elementary School in the evening in their library. Please be advised that this Wednesday, from 7 to 8.30 p.m., in our Karen Theater at Medford High School will be course selection night for our eighth grade students who will be attending the high school complex next year. Parents, guardians, caregivers, and students, you're all urged to please attend. In the sports arena, middle school basketball, our Mustang middle school basketball program had a very successful season. The boys' team finished with a 9-1 and one record. The girls' team just finished, and they were at 8-2, and two, but actually since they just won the game this evening, they played against Everett, and the girls won this evening 34-32. That would have been a nail-biter, a great <laughs> game to have watched. So congratulations to both our boys' and girls' basketball teams. The boys' game tomorrow, their final, will take place tomorrow and the girls final will take place in Revere on Wednesday. Tristan Howard, one of our uh, great athletes at Medford High School, last Sunday at the MSTCA Boys and Girls Coaches Invitational held at the Reggie Lewis Center. Tristan Howard, our own Mustang, he won the 55 meter dash with a time of 6.56 seconds. Amazingly, he shares the title with Lauren High School students, Lawrence High School student, Jeremel German. 
they finished together in a dead heat. So the people who were at um, Reggie Lewis said it was another nail biter, fascinating, exciting race, but just wonderful um, things that are happening with our own Mustangs. Um, Sunday, the Medford Girls Varsity indoor track team finished in second place. This is again our Greater Boston League track championship. We finished right behind Malden with a total of 88 points. Five of the girls finished first in the following races. I just want to recognize them. We have junior Anaya Crump. She won the 300 meters. Sophomore Caressa Andrews won the high jump. Freshman Anna Casey won the 600 meters. Freshman Ayasmin D'Souza Vieira won the 1,000 meters. And freshman Maria Colombo won the two mile run. <coughs> Congratulations to all of our athletes, our girls, varsity indoor track team members. I also want to just highlight uh, another community outreach program. The Columbus School participated in Pennies for Patients, which raises money for Leukemia Society. And the Columbus School collected $3,336.59. Mrs. Galizo's class was ra raised the most out of that fundraising. Her classroom alone raised $936 in pennies, which is truly outstanding for the school. <laughs> they were awarded a pizza party from the Leukemia Society for their outstanding efforts. And we want to say a special thank you to Assistant Principal Nancy Sherman Hudson, who led this important fundraising event. Great job, Columbus School. Please keep up the good work. So at the beginning of January, the Medford Vocational Technical High School's DECA program competed in the District 6 competition held at Endicott College in Beverly. Students competed in business, law, and ethics, apparel and accessories marketing, automotive services marketing, entrepreneurship, human resource management, quick service restaurant management, restaurant and food service management, and sports and entertainment marketing. Congratulations are in order for David Mai and Nevaeh Clark, who placed third in the apparel and accessories marketing. Ruth McLaughlin and Nick Gomes, who placed third in automotive service marketing. In late February, these students will be competing at the DECA State Tournament at the Copley Plaza Hotel in Boston in the hopes of qualifying for the international DECA competition being held in Nashville in April. And Mr. Uh, Principal Chad Fallon will uh, present to you a little later this evening. I am pleased to also announce two of our fine arts students who were selected to the prestigious Massachusetts Music Educators District Junior Festival. Two of our trombonists have been accepted to this pre prestigious Massachusetts Music Educators Association Northeast District Junior Festival due to their successful audition on Saturday. They are none other than our Medford High School freshman, Tegan Mustone, the name sounds familiar, <laughs> offspring of our wonderful member, Miss Mia Mustone, and Andrews Middle School seventh grader, Kian Leo, who were selected to rehearse and perform with the festival band under a guest conductor with other students from across Northeastern Massachusetts. The concert will be held at the Gavin Middle School in Wakefield in March. Congratulations to our fine arts students. In addition, I'm, almost I'm also pleased to announce that two McGlynn Middle School students received regional awards in the 2019-2020 
Massachusetts Scholastic Art and Writing Awards program. Sofia Hernandez won a gold key and Kenza Balula won a silver key. Medford has had a number of students receive honorable mentions, but being named gold and silver key winners is a great honor. They will be presented with their awards in March at Tufts University. Congratulations to these students, fantastic job. Just a reminder, coming up this Saturday, the Medford Family Network's annual Valentine's Day Festival, Ice Cream Social, is being held this Saturday at the McGlynn School Cafeteria from 11 a.m. until 1.30. All of you are invited to support the Ice Cream Social and Medford Family Network. It is always a great event. Last week, I had the opportunity to participate in cookies and convo at the high school. And I just had an opportunity to connect with staff and teachers during their lunch break over cookies and just talk and um, hear feedback and just have wonderful conversation. And I look forward to spreading that out to additional schools, but I was very pleased with the teachers who were able to avail themselves to participate in that. Additionally, earlier today, I had the opportunity to be with Global Scholars, which is one of our special programs that runs at the middle school levels, along with um, Dr. Riccadelli, Dr. Riccadelli, our Director of Curriculum. We were able to look at instruction. Teachers got to talk and really listen to students during their student panel, um, getting feedback from eighth graders on what they thought were the strengths and suggestions for how that special program can continue to improve. And so that was um, a wonderful opportunity that happened just earlier today. Lastly, my last um, invitation is that Mayo Longo Kearns, volunteer members of the transition team, they're going to be hosting a beautification day on Sunday, February 23rd, starting at eight o'clock in the morning at our high school campus. For anyone who may want to join the volunteer crew, um, we're looking for interested parties. You can contact the mayor's office or contact my office to sign up. Um, and I'd like to just thank everyone. And those are our announcements for today. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Superintendent. Um, recommendation to approve a donation to CCSR, Michael Squawker. Is Michael here? If somebody wants to move to table that, or I, um, you could just yes, I can I can leave it. But uh, is who's here? I can so I can just please. <laughs> Medford Center for Citizenship and Social Responsibility was awarded five thousand oh, wow. dollars as one of the recipients of the one hundred and twenty-five thousand community fund payment from Encore Boston, granted by the Medford Community Fund. We recommend that the school committee approve this donation. Roll call vote. Member Kretz. Um, yes, I just wanted to report out an update about the community fund grant checks. Um, this morning, I received an email from Alicia Nunley, Finance Director, Auditor, um, and the Chief of Staff in the Mayor's Office, Dave Rodriguez, is working on a communications to update everybody about the grant checks. Um, under the guidance of the Department of Revenue, um, they're, they're working on a mechanism to fund the awards from the casino to the individual recipients. Since the casino just opened last summer, this is the first time the city has been made, has made awards based on the surrounding community agreement. And we want to do this with, um, do this in a legal and in transparent way. Um, so if, if everybody, we really appreciate your patience, um, your continued patience, and hopefully we'll see um, an update um, either on the website or, you know, maybe by email sometime this week. Just wanted to share that update. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Motion for approval of the 5,000 to CCSR. <coughs> Roll call vote has been requested. Member <coughs> Grant? Yes. Yes. Member McLaughlin? Yes. Member Mastone? Yes. Member Rousseau? Yes. Member Vanderclute? Yes. Mayor Luongo Kern? Yes.
All those in favor, none opposed, paper passes. Recommendation number three, to approve field trip DECA state competition, Mr. Chad Fallon. I have Nevea on my right and Burley on my left. We are here for approval for the DECA state competition, which will be held at the Copley Hotel in Boston. Burley, would you like to say something about DECA? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Burley Vigasama, and I am a junior at Medford Vocational Technical High School. And DECA is a high school competition for business students, and we compete with other business students around the country. Novea and I will be pre presenting the SBE manual. The SBE manual is Mustang Travels at States this year. The SBE manual has won States and Internationals in the previous year. Mustang, Travel is, Mustang Travels is managed by students. It's a service for teachers. It's a, easier, it's a easier and affordable process process to rent vehicles for field trip. And it will soon be available for surrounding Medford Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. So in a nutshell, we have school vans that we rent out to the community for field trips or for um, uh, other schools. Sometimes the middle schools will borrow some vans, and these guys came up with a plan to have it almost like a rental agency. So the manual that they created for this before has won in previous years. So they'll be competing on this at the state level. So we're seeking approval for the hotel and the registration costs. Oh, great. Motion, approval. Motion for approval by Member Van de Kloot, seconded by Member McLaughlin. Um, Member Kretz. Yes, um, I just wanted to say, um, you know, thank you for bringing this report and thank you for coming out and, and explaining that. Um, I did, and the superintendent answered already, I did have a question like who was going to be competing and she explained it was like the various different programs, the automotive and the, um, I forget where my list went, but um, so that, that answered my other question and, um, and I just want to wish the students good luck and um, I hope to hear and hear back from you um, after the competition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know. <laughs> I'll be going. I've never been. <laughs> yeah. Through the chair, how many days is the competition? Mm -hmm. Thursday night, Friday night, the awards are Saturday. So they stay two nights they in a hotel? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. Thank yes. you. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fallon. Motion for approval. We all set. Okay. Number four, recommendation to approve donation to Medford Vocational Technical <laughs> High School. Field trip, yeah. we, but we did, I believe. We did. A roll call for the field trip? Member Graham? Yes. Member Craig? Yes. Member McLaughlin? Yes. Member Stone? Yes. Member Lee? Yes. Member Vincent? Yes. Member Vincent? Yes. Well, in favor and in the negative, paper passes. Um, now, number four recommendation to approve donation to Medford Vocational Technical High School. Hi again, so Steve Nardone, a Medford Vocational Technical High School graduate from the class of 1979, a longtime friend of the school and a successful business owner in the area, uh, has donated some equipment to our program. This isn't the first time, but this um, is one of the largest donations in a, uh, you know, in a while, and it, it's worth Adam uh, and explaining a little bit more to you about what it is. Adam Burns, electrical instructor. Hello, my name is Adam Burns. I'm <coughs> one of the electrical instructors at Medford Vocational Technical High School. Uh, the equipment that was donated uh, was, is in three pieces. I'll go smallest to largest. Smallest is a cordless bandsaw, which the students use to cut uh, steel members and conduit and pipe with. Uh, next up is a seven foot, 60 position cat six rack, which is used to terminate network wiring. Third is the uh, the largest is a fire a, a fire alarm system that is up to date. It's addressable. It's more advanced than is in most buildings. 
uh, it was custom made by Nardone Electric and it is mounted on a portable system where students can uh, create addressable fire alarm systems which are computer controlled and they also send signals out to the fire department so it's all uh, it's all a big system and each component is addressable so we have a whole system plus a lot of components for that and uh, hopefully we're going to start using it soon Member Rousseau. Oh, this is amazing. I'm looking at this stuff thinking, like, could we get that in our schools? <laughs> um, I'm sure we need more than one, though, for our school. I think they looked at this system for the school buildings, the older school buildings, and it's extremely expensive. That, that's what I was <laughs> going to imagine. Um, so I would certainly motion to approve this. Member Kretz. Yes, um, so I just wanted to know, um, so the state-of-the-art fire alarm control panel, so does that, like, um, when the stu are the students going to be learning, like, you know, where they can detect where a fire might be, or, yes. yeah, that's what I thought. So, like, it will, like, I like, identify, like, where, like, the location of the fire and then pin it off to the fire department? Exactly. So, mm -hmm. in, a, in an older system, like in this building, mm -hmm. you have zones. This room would be a zone. Mm -hmm. In newer systems, each detector is addressable. So each detector can not only tell if there's a fire, it can also tell if it's in trouble, someone maybe have tampered with it, or if it needs servicing. So the fire department knows exactly which detector to go to. So say they're going to the electrical shop, and, and the old system would be the electrical shop. So they, they would have to find it. Now they would get a signal that would tell them exactly where to go in that building. So that saves time and it saves lives eventually. Yep, and that's just amazing. It's amazing, and, and thank you very much to the Nardone um, Electrical Support and for their support. And it's just, it is incredible. And I just, um, I just thought it was incredible myself. And um, and what does the data rack do? Like, is that like a, um, like a, like I'm not sure what that is either. Sure. I know. So yeah. So in a building, mm -hmm. every single data port where every single person plugs in their computer or Wi-Fi port. That is connected to a cable that has to run back to a server. So every mm -hmm. single cable on a floor will run back to one server. Mm -hmm. And those <coughs> cables have to be punched down to a rack. So it looks sort of like an old-fashioned uh, operator switchboard where yeah. you see a lot of plugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and what this does is it connects the users to the servers in the building, hardware. Um, every building has them, and this is very important now, even though it's not in our frameworks, our advisory board has recommended that our kids learn this stuff because every single light fixture from now to the future forever is going to be cloud-based computer controlled. So they need, this stuff is not only for data, it's also for lights, fire alarm, cameras, everything. Mm -hmm. So these electricians have to know. Yeah. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you. Kathy, you asked the question everyone wanted to ask. Thank you. <laughs> what are these things? <laughs> yeah, I just, I really didn't know, and I didn't Google because I thought I would ask and find out from the experts. <laughs> thank you very much. Sure. Member Vindicloot. Yeah. I wanted to say thank you to Mr. Nardone and ask that we send out a letter to him. Uh, I know um, that I've seen his name for many years giving us different, uh, different things and, and donations, so I'm very appreciative to him. Thank you. We need to do a roll call vote to accept this. Motion for approval by him. Member by Russo, Paul seconded by Member Kretz. Roll call vote. Member Graham? Yes. Member Kretz? Yes. Member McLaughlin? Yes. Member Mastone? Yes. Member Rousseau? Yes. Member Vanderkloot? Yes. Mayor Luongo Kern? Yes. All in favor and then opposed, paper passes. Number five, recommendation to approve donation from ExxonMobil. Ms. Christine yes. Patterson. Good evening, thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is a unique um, circumstance uh, whereby one of our business partners, the Medford Square Mobile Gas Station, submitted a nomination um, through the ExxonMobil Education Alliance grant for Medford High School. 
So I was uh, contacted by the Global Partners Territory Manager that we had been selected through this nomination to uh, receive a $500 grant um, for Medford High School purposes. So um, there is a slight additional piece of paperwork that's required for Global Partners to be able to provide and distribute that um, grant if we do choose to accept it. So the recommendation is to accept the generous donation and to send a thank you letter to Medford Square Mobile Station for its nomination. Thank you. Thank you. Member Kretz. Uh, yes. Um, I, just, I just had a quick question. I just wanted to know um, now, can this award be used for anything? Um, are there any plans like for the award, what they're going to use it for? I really, I did look through it and I wasn't sure it says something in math and science. Um, for higher education. So I wasn't sure, sure if it was going to a certain department or No, was so it, this would be a general um, school donation that we okay. would identify um, through the math and science departments that that was the stipulation of this grant. Mm -hmm. We have not earmarked it as of yet um, okay. prior to acceptance. All right, thank you. I'm assuming roll call vote is required. Motion yep. for approval by Member Graham, seconded Second. by Paul, Member Great. Vanderkloot. A, a, um, roll call vote is required. Member Graham? Yes. Member Kretz? Yes. Member McLaughlin? Yes. Member Mastone? Yes. Member Rousseau? Yes. Member Vanderkloot? Yes. Member Longo Kern? Mayor yes. Longo Kern? All those in favor and then the negative paper passes. Number six, report, report on personnel activity. Ms. Christine Patterson. Thank you. Um, again, provided uh, just for your awareness is an activity report for this fiscal year uh, beginning July 1st of 2019, um, and it was current through the January 30th uh, timeframe prior to uh, sending out this packet. I think it's noteworthy to um, indicate, and, and I want to thank the Business Center team, uh, Human Resources and Payroll for processing all of these as you hear the number of activity it's quite significant. So the team has onboarded 185 new hires, and that was not including additional pending hires that have not finalized all of their requirements to be entered into payroll. So we've had a significant amount of onboarding, which this is for all employee groups. So this is not just identifying teachers and paras, this is, um, these are daily subs, these are, uh, after school program uh, workers, all categories, uh, 185 new hires. In addition to the new hires, we've processed 38 retirements and or resignations through the district. We've also had significant activity with a total of 61 uh, cases of long-term illnesses, full year leaves of absence, and workers' compensation cases, of which those we've had to provide additional staffing. So the 185 is also a result of some of this uh, activity um, based on full year leaves and long-term leaves. So we still need to cover classrooms, we need to cover the other functions throughout the district when uh, an individual is on said leave. So we have, um, had significant activity, and I believe um, this report is for your, just for your review. Thank you. Member Kretz. Yes, I just had a quick question, because uh, I know this question comes up a lot. Um, what is the difference between a long-term substitute, a daily sub, and a per diem sub? You know, and I'm just curious, um, even at my own work where I work at MTRS, it comes up a lot, and each school district has a different like definition for what it is in their school district. Um, some require like um, DESE certification for long-term subs, some don't. Um, the same for per diem and daily subs. So I was just wondering what Medford, what what Medford's definition was. Sure, mm -hmm. we do have per diem and daily subs. That term is synonymous, so that means that. Um, the substitute calls into the sub pool that is open each day as um, staff members need to um, call out sick and or be absent for any reason. So our sub pool is active um, and they are just daily subs. Mm -hmm. They are not necessarily licensed in, in that capacity, but they mm -hmm. are covering for classes um, for absences. The long-term sub category is for 
uh, a situation where we have an extended leave that we know somebody may be out due to illness or due to maternity leave and dependent on the candidate if they are licensed or not they would have a different pay rate mm -hmm. so it, it's dependent on their licensure and the timeline of their coverage okay um, and then I just had one question because some of the um, locations were listed as um, mail like for example like M-A-I-L sure. for the location and I was just wondering what does that mean like it, it was like really just miscellaneous mm -hmm. throughout the, the, the spreadsheet yeah. so this is a, pay, a report from payroll mm -hmm. so this the location just indicates the method on which um, any checks would be distributed oh, okay if they mm -hmm. if they received um, a live check it would either be mailed it would be dispersed to each of the building locations based on where that employee was located and there are some lo uh, some employees that are considered district wide, so they do move um, from building to building. Okay, thank you, okay. Member Rousseau. Report. Um, I have three questions since one of them's already been covered. How many hours did it take to create this report? <laughs> and do you? I mean, a, a ballpark. Uh, between uh, fine tuning the report and staff, a couple hours. A couple hours. Thank you. Um, on page two, uh, one of the positions is just listed as the title being school, um, about seven or eight up from the bottom. So they would be non-unit uh, members, and Again, that's a category that's in the payroll system, right. and it would likely be referring to a daily sub okay. and just got um, a school identifier rather than a sub. Oh, I see. Okay, that yes. makes sense because they could be anywhere. Correct. And then on the very last page of the, the new hires, um, the, the first column says non-unit ISS. What's the ISS? So the ISS is instructional support staff. Thank you. So it's basically a building-based substitute. So that person is considered a full year. Uh, they are assigned to that building, oh. and they are um, able to be dispersed at the, from the principal based on the need in the building if there's not enough coverage. Thank you. Member Graham. Um, I noticed that in the report there were a number of retirements and about 60% of those retirements were not happening in the summer, but they were happening after the start of the school year. And I was just wondering, is that normal? Um, is 60% typical or is this sort of an anomaly of a year? So again, the, the header is resignations slash retirements so okay. not all of those are retirements but we do have retirements that happen outside of just the the july and august months it's dependent on their date of birth in some uh cases where they're they're not eligible until certain times of the year so that is that's a normal occurrence um, but again all of these are not considered uh, retirements so it's normal that 60% of our resignations slash retirements would happen during the, the, school, the operating school year, or is that unusual in some way? It's, it's definitely, um, it, it shows you the significance of turnover in certain categories of the workforce, and that's, yeah. that's a norm. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then I was also reading that we have, like, 60, I think it's like 61 people on uh, leave of absence, is that correct? No, again, that was total of different types of activity. So okay. we had 11 that are on a full year leave of absence. We had 18 that were on leaves of absence, but we are expecting them to return at some point during the year. 25 have been on a leave of absence and have since returned. And the others were uh, workers' comp cases. And is that, again, is that like a typical year, or is this unusual this in some way? This has been a, a bubble year. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Member McLaughlin. Thank you. Thanks for the report, um, to Assistant Superintendent Patterson. Um, I have a few questions on the um, 
Resignation and retirements. Um, it looks like since July we've had um, eight paras um, retire or resign. I'm wondering what, which those are. Are they resign or retire or do you know? The majority are re resignations. Resignations. Mm -hmm. And um, do you know are we filling those positions or what We've the status is? We've been actively uh, trying to fill all positions. Uh -huh. Yes. So are, there, are we down eight paras right now? Do you know? We're not down eight paras, no. No. How many are we down? I believe we're down um, two. I think we've got some pending hires taking place. Okay, so you've hired six um, of the eight that have, re you've replaced six of the eight yes. that have, okay. And so then for substitutes, for the daily substitutes um, and the per diem substitutes and the long-term substitutes, um, I was given information and I'm wondering if this is helpful or accurate, if there's a, if there's a para that calls in sick to the special education classrooms, the system comes up as no substitute required. Is that accurate? It's dependent on where the para is uh, assigned. So a gen ed para is not necessarily filled. We, we try to go with the high needs groups that um, we do open a slot for filling. But it's noteworthy to indicate that even without the paras or just the general um, the teaching that it's difficult to fill and sometimes the nature of when they are providing a sick day or a day that they'll be out it's too late for the sub pool to activate so there's a number of things that um, are indicative of whether or not a classroom environment is going to be fully um, covered and that's where we have the ISS's in the building to provide that additional support. So how does that work if there's an IEP that's requiring paras in the classroom if the para is not being replaced if they're out sick? That's a totally different scope outside of just um, this personnel uh, report. I, I, can't, I can't speak to that in terms of the IEP requirements. Um, but in terms of replacing substitutes in the classroom, so regarding the personnel report. So if a pair is out and they're saying no substitute required on the, right. on the personnel list when a pair calls in sick, they're not, there's no substitute going into that classroom. And I guess these are also high needs classrooms. They're not, they're not uh, gen ed. If they are high needs, they, they, it is usually open to the sub pool. Whether or not we get a, a uh, an active substitute for that is it, it, it's not determined if it's actually filled. We don't dictate those slots so the pool is open to anybody that's assigned as a daily sub and they actually select which placements that they will go on a given day. So even if a, even if a para position opened up that a substitute was required, there's no guarantee that it would get filled. Sure, Just as I understand that. it's not guaranteed that an elementary teacher at one of the other schools would be filled either. Sure, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But is the system, is the software system coming up saying no substitute required, which obviously if that's what it's saying, then there's definitely not going to be a substitute, never mind whether there are any available or not. That's what I'm asking. No, the majority are open for substitutes. Are open no substitutes? Are open for substitutes. Oh, open for substitute. In yes. what instance would it say no substitute required? If there, if it was identified as a gen ed and not required for the para coverage. So the initial intent of the system was to provide coverage for the teachers in the classroom. So that had been the the focus to, to provide coverage as the teacher. So in terms of the paras, those with, with the exception of the high needs classrooms that they always need coverage, it had been closed off that a para might not necessarily have coverage. Okay, so I guess uh, I'm wondering, is it a personnel question or a special ed question that I should be directing this if there are high needs classrooms where a para is calling in sick and the, and the personnel memo that comes up on the whatever your software system is on the website that says no substitute required. How is that addressed? Would that be personnel? Would that be special education? Yes, we, we would certainly, if there was somebody that was erroneously categorized as not requiring a sub, we would certainly change that. Okay. And so who's we? We let you know if yes. we see that? Okay. 
Yes, working Thank with you. the special ed uh, director. Okay, so if paras are getting, um, if, there, if, if information is coming up when a para puts calls in sick and the system says no substitute required and we know it's a substantially separate or high needs classroom, they should be letting folks know that that's a glitch in the system and that shouldn't be happening. Is that what I'm hearing you say? It's not a glitch. It would, they would just need to notify the special ed director and we can certainly meet on that to revisit those uh, paras that have been assigned to this, the high needs groups. Okay, great, thank you. Maybe in your, in your um, behavioral health, special ed, and public service subcommittee you can go over that. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Motion to receive and place on file, offered by motion, motion by uh, Member Kratz, seconded by Member Vandeklute. All those in favor? Aye. Paper passes. Number seven, a report on 2020 middle school lottery. Dr. Bernadette Riccadelli. Good evening. Good evening. Just about a year ago, on February 11th, 2019, the Medford School Committee voted unanimously, it was a 7-0 to 0 vote, to implement a random lottery system with the goal of balancing the racial and socioeconomic differences between the Andrews Middle School and the McGlynn Middle School. Current middle school socioeconomic data indicate a more balanced grade 6 student population as compared to grade 7 and 8 suggesting that last year's lottery has helped the district move toward the goal of a better balanced student population. I did attach those numbers to this report, so hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at that. This year, in 2020, the district will continue with those efforts toward creating a more equitable school community and embracing Mefford's diversity while continuing to build upon its strengths and to encourage all families to believe in one Medford. For this year's lottery, and consistent with the 2019 protocol, an equitable number of students from each elementary school will be assigned to each of the two middle schools while controlling for sibling preference and programmatic needs. The district will also follow a similar protocol uh, for sibling preference as it did last year in 2019. The district has already begun pre-identifying those sibling students and this year, which is a change from last year, based on suggestions from members of this committee, both an opt-in and an opt-out option will be on the form that will be distributed to applicable students on February 26, 2020. So again, this year, those identified with the option for a sibling preference will be asked to either opt-in or opt-out. The district has contracted Douglas M. Thorpe, CPA, from the firm of Johnson, O'Connor, and Wakefield to conduct the lottery drawing. Parents and guardians are invited to attend the drawing, and it is scheduled for Thursday, March 26, 2020, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. in the library at Medford High School. This is roughly one month earlier than it occurred last year. Results will be posted on our website and on our blog, and will be available to view within hours of the drawing. Letters confirming each student's middle school assignment will go out to all grade five students by April 1st, 2020. Following the lottery, grade five students and their parents are invited to attend their assigned middle school orientation program at the McGlynn Middle School on May 6th and at the Andrews Middle School on May 7th. During these orientation programs, students will tour the building, learn about programs and activities, and meet their principal, assistant principal, teachers, and other school staff. I've also included a timeline of events. Uh, Superintendent Edward Vinson mentioned the superintendent information sessions that will occur between Tuesday, March 3rd and Tuesday, March 10th. Uh, those events will occur, as she indicated, um, between those dates. These dates will be posted on our website and will be available for parents to see. Other lottery dates include the February 26th sibling opt-in, opt-out form. There's they, those forms will be due the following week on Tuesday, March 4th. On Wednesday, March 18th, each fifth grade student will receive a lottery number. 
in a letter addressed to the parent guardian and sent home with the student. So again, we do not announce student names. Students are identified by number. Each school will have a series. I think last year we did the, the Brooks School with the 200 series, the McGlynn School with the 300 series, and, and so on, so that numbers are specifically identified for specific elementary schools. Uh, again, the drawing will occur on Thursday, March 26th from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. in the high school. And on Wednesday, April 1st, those, um, those assignments will go out to the students. And again, May 6th and May 7th at the McGlynn and the Andrews schools, respectively, the open, the open house. So again, we've attached the data sheets. The data sheets do indicate that some change has occurred. If you look at the grade six results versus the grade seven and eight um, data information on the students, you will see that there is a difference in the, the demographic data, the free lunch, reduced lunch, and, and other categories. At this point, I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Member Van de Kloot. Um, just one thing in the timeline that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I note that um, the sibling opt-in, opt-out form is due on March 4th. Mm -hmm. But the open houses, um, the uh, three of them occur after that deadline. So for me, it would make more sense for the uh, sibling opt-in, opt-out form to be sent home, to be um, due uh, on March 11th. Um, you, you're, you're, you're not incorrect. Um, we were, the, the dates were chosen because they coincide with, I believe, PTO meetings, as, as I have been told. So based on the work that we did last year, we needed three weeks to back up into the sibling. We can fast forward that. Um, I will tell you with, with our team, it is, it is a lot of work to do that. We were hoping to get this information out via the principals about the sibling opt-in, sibling opt-out. So this year, would it, which, where it is not simply a sibling opt-out, we felt like the form would be very specific. We want an answer. If we don't get an answer from a family on whether they want to opt-in or opt-out, we're going to follow up with that family. So there is more work on that end. but. I, I do sure. understand that the, the dates for the information sessions were selected because they coincide with PTO meetings. Uh, but, you know, if, with... If it would work such that um, the sibling opt-in, opt-out form is not a drop-dead, but which is to say that instead they, they'd be collected with the ideal on March 4th. But if there were um, forms that were not turned out in, there would be follow-up with the parent. I would be comfortable with that. Um, but that's a, a procedural thing. If it's, if it's meant that if the parent doesn't uh, return the form by that date, then I'm not particular, you know, one way or the other, mm -hmm. then I'm not particularly comfortable with it. But I assume you'll, you'd be following up with it? So we, we've discussed this, and we are going to follow up with each parent to make sure that there is no, no question as to do they want in or out. Okay. If you can make that... That makes then I'm more can. comfortable with it. Thank you, okay. Member Kratz. Hi, thank you, Dr. Rickzelli. You're welcome. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, I I noticed last year we the feedback we got was we didn't communicate, you know, timely early, and I'm happy to see that we're getting this information out, all the dates out so early. It's it's only beginning. It's February. Um, and um, I just wanted to check, I have just a couple questions, two are really simple. Um, are the open houses going to have the student-led tours? I know they had them last year where the students um, also participated in the tours along with the teachers and staff. Um, and that was something that I think a lot of the students really appreciated seeing and meeting other students that are in the middle schools. Mm -hmm. Just so yeah. mm -hmm. I, I have not discussed the, mm -hmm. the details yet with the principals. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that is that those open houses are going to be similar. Okay. I know the curriculum directors were there. I, I attended. Mm -hmm. I thought they, yeah. they were quite smooth and people yeah. liked it. So certainly we want to repeat what was good. And if there's anything that can be improved upon, mm -hmm. certainly we want to do that. 
Yes. Uh, Mr. Tucci. Good evening, everybody. I'm happy to take that, that uh, question right there. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, hallmarks of our uh, open house last year were those student ambassador-led yes. tours. Mm -hmm. And we are very interested in uh, not only having them okay. once again, but also adding on to them and uh, incorporating the students as much as we can. Because that was one of the best pieces of uh, feedback that we received. The yes. students mm -hmm. leading the effort and yep. uh, showing the way and exercising those great leadership opportunities to you know, brag about their school and how much they're really proud to be a part of. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then these are kind of fun questions. Um, and I just wanted to know, um, last year there w we had the middle school barbecue in the summer, and it was a great, I thought it was a great success. I, I went, I observed, and Peter, he did a, little, a lot of burgers. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to know if that was maybe in the plans. I know it's early, but if we were planning to do something like that again this summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so actually, <laughs> following February vacation, um, planning to work with sixth and seventh graders mm -hmm. um, to form a committee between the two middle schools to not only see how we can do the barbecue, but what are the things we might be able to add to mm -hmm. maybe make that more of an overall fun day yeah. um, and an approach to um, to the introduction to their new middle schools. Great, great, and that you know keep us up to date because I know a lot of us want to help out and volunteer. Absolutely, great. and we'll be yeah. probably looking for donations and uh, other support <laughs> to make it really awesome. So. <laughs> Um. <laughs> Are you all set, Kathy? I just had one other question. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, to know um, if the auditing company was going to be doing anything differently um, to um, ensure the equitable number of students from each elementary school assigned to the two middle schools. Um, you know, there's just some, you know, I've heard that, you know, one school didn't have a lot of students in that middle school and, you know, that was still a little bit fuzzy, you know, last year and so I was just wondering if there was any plans to do anything a little bit differently um, to balance it out a little bit better or... Mm -hmm. So the plan is to do the process similar to what we did last year. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is um, true. So if you'll notice, I put in there that there's an equitable mm -hmm. distribution yeah. of, of within the lottery. Uh, but we need to control for students who need specific programs. If a specific program is housed at one of the two middle schools, right. we need to take that into consideration. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's big. That's what takes yes. the most amount of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Director of Student Services has been working on the list. We really revet these lists, these lists to make sure that we're doing it the right way. That's less a function of the CPA okay. than it is a function of us mm -hmm. knowing our students going through and making sure that they're getting, going to the school that's most appropriate for their, okay. for their needs. So I, I understand that there mm -hmm. were you know, there were questions last year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the interest of transparency, our, our numbers right. are there, and yeah. you know, we're we're comfortable sharing them with anybody. We also have a, a reason for what we're doing. Uh, the CPA, the CPA's role, uh, they they met with us and they went over the process with us. Um, probably three weeks before the lottery last year, but their primary function was to be there on that day. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was there behind the scenes, as was our data manager. So we were there running around, making sure that if there were questions, and you know, the, the CPA, they, they did a pretty smooth job, but their job really is to pull those numbers from Stat Tracker, which is that computer-generated uh, random number-generated okay. system for us. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Madam Superintendent. I just was going to echo what Dr. Riccadelli <laughs> just shared, that um, uh, in our individualized, the, the school presentations, we say that it is not an equal balance, but we do try to do it in an equitable way, a fair way. So again, English learners um, would be assigned to the McGlynn School. Um, depending on what the specific programmatic areas are. So we don't have control over those numbers. It could be a fluctuation from one year to another year, but um, you know that was the most, I would say, equitable way to be able to try to balance the numbers. So that piece um, does need to remain intact so that students are assigned to the right programmatic area. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. School Committee Woman McLaughlin. Welcome. And I appreciate the effort at equity in the school lottery. I know that this 
a lot of hard work and uh, work in progress. So thank you for the report. Um, I do have some questions around the equitable piece of it, and I appreciate you acknowledging that we're doing you know, the best we can with what we have in terms of the programmatic elements. You had said that you know, we have to ensure that the children are going to the school that's most appropriate for their needs, which I think is, you know, begs a bigger question in our district around equity. All of our schools should be able to um, deliver for each of our children's needs. And I know that that's a process that we're working towards and that I hope that the school committee continues to work towards. Um, but I have questions in that realm. So, and we get a lot of these questions. So getting back to what was happening last year with the, um, with the, with the audit, um, some of our schools have disproportionately more um, high need students, whether they be English learners, students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged students. Mm -hmm. And so if you're coming from a pool of uh, elementary school students that have a higher uh, 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 population of high need students, and then they're rounding out the number, uh, or uh, everyone's getting the same amount of uh, students that are in the lottery. Um, one school has a disproportionate amount of you know, uh, mm -hmm. English learners or students with disabilities, and then their numbers are skewed because they are going to a particular environment. And so how is that being adjusted for is one question that I have. Another is um, we talk about sibling preference. What happens if you have a sibling that uh, is a student with a disability that's going to a programmatic piece? Or if you have a you know, sibling who you've aged out of the uh, specific English learner program that might be ap applied for that program? Uh, or for that school, uh, and you're going to another. So how are we addressing sibling preference for our students with high needs, um, or that have siblings with high needs? And then the third is, what if students um, are identified after the fact? What if you know the lottery happens and they're enrolled into a school, um, and then they're subsequently identified as uh, having a particular disability, or they enroll into our schools initially and they're in one school, um, and then they're subsequently identified? How are we addressing that? Are we taking them out of a school mid-year um, to deal with programmatic elements, or how how is that being addressed? Okay, I should have written down. Yeah, no, I can look at them start. again. Okay, yeah. okay. One, oh, two, and three. Yeah. Well, let me start with number three, where Please. you said, what if a student is identified after the fact? Sure, yeah. Okay, first and foremost, we need to look at student needs, and it has happened. So if a student, if there's a specific need for a student and needs a, a student needs a specific program at one of the two schools, that's what's going to drive where that student is going to go. Um, we like to think we're going to catch that ahead of time, but things happen. So you, the intent is not to shift students from one school to the other, but situations come up, and if that comes up, we're open-minded enough to, to do what, what is in the best interest of the child. The second question, I believe, was about sibling preference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are a number of cases where a student falls in can fall in a number of different categories. So it is possible there's a student that is an EL student, a student that has a, a, a special education programmatic requirement, and perhaps they are a sibling. So, and, and I think that did happen last year where there was at least one student that fell into three different categories. So first we go to what's the programmatic need of the student. So we're looking at the need of the student. Um, and in many cases, that is what, what's going to drive this. But there's a possibility that um, it's not, and it's, it's the sibling preference. Um, we had a number of conversations with parents last year about this. Uh, I think there, I th there may have been one that opted the, the sibling preference over the, the programmatic recommendation. So I think the bottom line in this case is that we need to look at each case individually. And again, it's, it's what the child needs. So I can't, I can't say it's going to happen this way. We need to look at the situation. Thank you. And, and then the first one, I'm sorry, can you, if you can? Oh, it was just how are we going to address the equity for students with high needs um, so that if we're being random and trying to be equitable across the schools that we're not addressing all of the students um, in terms of the equity for the lottery because of the programmatic elements, but I think that's a, probably a much bigger question than you can address tonight, Dr. We Kim. did not control for high needs unless that need was a programmatic need. Right. Um, if it was EL, if it was a certain special ed need. Right. So we did not look at the socioeconomics. But what I think, when you look at those results, when you look at the difference of grade six 
the current grade six um, differentiation, differentiation between two schools, and you look at grade seven and eight, you see much less of a difference in grade six. So I think that is a that's a result that's a, mm -hmm. probably a byproduct of this of this lottery. It's not perfect, but I think there's a better balance. So could we get comparable data, or perhaps this is a motion that I need to make to, for comparable data on those populations, so we can see what that distribution is among our schools of the uh, socioeconomic. Well, the economic, yeah, sure, if we have the data, economically disadvantaged, but also our students with uh, disabilities and our English learners, like what's the distribution across the schools? And so yes, for we the, if we know that the McGlynn is getting all of our English learners, then clearly they're going to have a higher need for English learners. So then equity is a, not that everybody gets the same, it's that everybody gets what they, what need, they need, right? right? So if we know that the right. McGlynn's going to have a higher need, are they getting more resources to support their need? Um, versus other schools. So I, I guess I'm looking for similar data. So I guess I'm making a motion that if we could, this is a great report, if we could have, um, I make a motion to have the same sort of data breakout for our students with disabilities, our English learners, and our um, economically disadvantaged mm -hmm. among the middle schools. If we could do that. I make a motion for that. Thank you. Thank you. Motion, um, I was just going to say from, from the chair, economic status is in here a bit through free and reduced lunch, but we can ask for further data. We, we can there's, drill down. We can drill down a little mm -hmm. bit, okay. Uh, motion by Member McLaughlin, seconded by Member Stone for comparable data based on the ELL, disabilities, and economic um, status. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. Member Graham. Is there um, a district-driven communication plan to families prior to the info sessions? So we, we are going to communicate. We actually have administrative meetings tomorrow morning, so this information will be disseminated to, to the administrators tomorrow, and we will ask them to disseminate it to their families. Uh, it's going to go on our website, it'll go on the blog, it'll go on the, the other communication that, that routinely goes out to parents so that they know about those information uh, sessions that begin on March 3rd. Um, okay, so I'd like to make a motion that something central comes from the district no later than February 14th that includes a number of items just so that families who may not have been paying attention to this last year because their kid was a distant fourth grader and now they're a fifth grader um, has some sort of backdrop information and some clarity uh, in addition to the dates which it's great that we have all of that stuff so I'd like to see a communication that includes our rationale for the lottery process selection um, a description and rationale of any student exemptions from the lottery um, an outline of all lottery pools, including school-specific breakdowns and sub-lotteries for students on IEPs and 504s if they apply, and then a schedule and timeline of key dates. I think a consistent communication with all of that information is super important, so I'm making a motion to ask the district to do that. Um, do you have an extra copy of that for Emily? Yep. <laughs> if you could just read that one more time so sure. we can all digest it. Thank you. Um, so I make a motion that the district send a communication to all fifth grade families no later than February 14th, 2020 to outline the lottery as follows. Um, number one, the rationale for lottery process of selection. Number two, a description and rationale of any student exemptions. Number three, an outline of all lottery pools, including school specific breakdowns and sub lotteries for students on IEPs or 504s if they exist, and a schedule and timeline of key dates. Motion for Approval by, yes, point of clarification, um, Member McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, just point of clarification, are you asking for uh, this member gram annually and then also for the sub lottery? Can you qualify what you mean by that? Um, I think last year there was some conversation about uh, some, IE, some students on IEPs were mm -hmm. part of a separate lottery than the students without IEPs so that there was balancing happening. 
um, or 504 is potentially right. So I think um, if, there, if there are sub-lotteries, I just want people to clearly understand what those, co what those co components and factors are so that when they um, get to the info session with you, they can come with informed questions. Um, and if they can't get there, we have given them the top to bottom understanding of what our plan is. Um, and I think this is such a huge improvement over the communication path of last year. I'm, as a fifth grade parent myself, thank you. <laughs> um, and I get a lot of questions about this. So that's the motion and that, so that's the clarification on that. Motion by um, Member Graham, seconded by Member McLaughlin. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? The motion passes. Would you like to speak? It, it, your button was on, so I didn't know. Madam Superintendent. Yes, and um, the rationale and the sub lottery, a lot of that was also explained in person. We had sample um, PowerPoints for every single school. Um, so a lot of that, it's just, you know, packaging it, putting it together, but definitely to explain the, um, that what we were talking about trying to get a greater balance between the schools that did take place. So that's something that um, I would gladly provide. Great. Mm -hmm. um, and I have one more. Oh, just press your button one more time. Okay. Member Graham. Um, I would also like to make a motion that we refer our middle school lottery process um, to the Communications, Community Engagement, and Strategic Planning Subcommittee for a view of our current communications and onboarding practices uh, related to middle school selection. Um, I'd like to further ask that the subcommittee report back to the school committee no later than October 31st of 2020 with any recommendations for the upcoming school year. Great. Motion by Member Graham, seconded by Ms. everybody, yep, uh, Member Kretz uh, in that subcommittee engagement, communication, and strategic planning is chaired by Member Graham, also Member Kretz and Member McLaughlin serve on that committee. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Paper passes. Thank you, Ms. Welcome. Dr. Cadelli. Number eight. Report on building bridges to kindergarten, Ms. Diane Caldwell. Good evening. So it's that time of year again. We're going to get our kindergartners or our pre-kindergartners ready for our kindergarten. Medford Public Schools will begin the registration process the week of March 4th. Informational packets with required documentation for registration will be available on the Medford Public Schools website or in our Parent Information Center at Medford High School by mid-February. In addition, we will present Building Bridges to Kindergarten on the following dates. Thursday, March 4th from 6.30 to 7.30 at Medford High School. Tuesday, April 7th from 6.30 to 7.30 at Medford High School. And on Wednesday, April 29th from 6.30 to 7.30 at the Columbus Elementary School. <clears throat> Excuse me. Marie Cassidy from Medford Family Network will offer child care services on March 4th and on April 7th. Parents should contact Marie at 781-393-2106 or email her at mcassidy at medford.k12.ma.us if they require these services. <coughs> the Columbus Elementary School will host a Building Bridges to Kindergarten on Wednesday, April 29th from 6.30 to 7.30. And if parents uh, need child care, they can contact Kathleen K at 393-2177 or at kk at method.k12.ma.us. A letter will be sent home at the end of February reminding parents to register for child care prior to the building bridges to kindergarten. As always, Marie Michelli, who is a veteran kindergarten teacher at the Brooks School, We'll do a PowerPoint presentation at all three presentations where she'll discuss the curriculum, um, busing, before and after school programs, and answer any questions that parents might have. Um, Megan Fidler Carey, who is our director of before and after school program, will begin registration the week of March 30th. And in her efforts to make the registration process more accessible, Megan will be meeting at each elementary school. 
She is finalizing the dates and times and will provide this information by mid-February. Um, I know that I spoke to Megan earlier today. She is trying to streamline the process because last year there were many questions about long lines at Medford High School. So this is the reason why she's going to each school individually. She's also looking into doing a lottery process so it's a little more equitable for our kiddos and families. Kindergarten Open House is going to be on Wednesday, May 6th at each of our elementary schools from 2 to 3 o'clock. Each family will receive a welcome to kindergarten packet. This is something that we do every single school year at each elementary school. So in your packet, there's a copy of a registration form. This is the flyer for building bridges to kindergarten. And then the back page is a letter from um, Tony Ray about what is required for our entering kindergartners for health. I'm happy to answer any Thank questions. You. Member McLaughlin. Yes. Thank you. Um, Assistant Superintendent Caldwell for this report. Um, and the flyer looks great. I'm happy to see the child care interpreter available by request. Um, and I really appreciate at the bottom of the flyer for the Medford um, Family Network uh, that, the, that the interpretation services are actually offered in the language mm -hmm. of um, folks, uh, or at least three of the languages of folks. So I'm wondering, is, can that information also be shared on our website if it's yes, not already? Yes, it will all be shared on the website. Okay, so yeah. with the, with the, in the language that folks need yes. for the number. Okay, great. And then for the health document, um, department document, um, folks will get that translated as needed based on whether they let you know Absolutely. that they need translation. The evening presentations, we actually have um, people who can translate there at the meetings Great. in case our families need that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Member Graham. Thank you for this report. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, are all the forms that are needed on our website, it seemed like as I read this that the the caregiver authorization affidavit is not on the website, like but available in the parent information center only. Um, I can I don't check know. on that for you. Perfect. Caregiver. caregiver? Yeah, the uh, caregiver authorization affidavit. Okay. Um, and then um, just a couple of other things about the form that sort of prompted some questions. So when we talk about um, school assignment, um, perhaps we can provide a more precise web link than medfordpublicschools.org because I think once they land there, it's not particularly clear how they would get to that listing of streets um, and school assignments. So there's probably a more precise There path. is a street listing. Are you saying it's, it's not on the website? No, what I'm saying is this instructs people to go to www.medfordpublicschools.org. Right. Mm -hmm. They would then have to hunt to get to the street listing. Oh. So if we, if exactly, so, <laughs> so I just want to make sure that we can provide sort of a clear path for people. Um, and then the flyer also says our after school program is first come first serve. And it sounds like that may not entirely be true. That, that may not entirely be true right now. In the past, that's what it had been. But um, Megan's looking to streamline it line it and make it more equitable and so she may be changing the process. So can we make sure that this flyer is updated so that it at least doesn't lead us down a path that is inaccurate potentially? She's doing that right okay, now as perfect. we speak. Um, and then the um, uh, other comment that I had about the process in general is um, there's just been a tremendous amount of discussion about kindergarten in the last few weeks all over social media and specifically there are a large number of parents weighing charter schools versus Medford Public Schools. Um, this is happening in particular this year because some surrounding community, communities are at their charter caps so now Medford families are being selected in the lottery in larger numbers than in the past. I believe some families have already had to commit to a charter based on the charter schools deadlines and all this has happened prior to any um, rollout of our kindergarten related communication. The questions from families uh, from new families are similar um, at this year, year over year over year at this time. And, but one recurring theme that I continue to hear and I get emails about all the time is that Medford does not seem to be super responsive to um, parent inquiries and requests for information or even tours of the schools outside of this official kindergarten rollout. 
Um, and what's ha it's not allowing us to put our best foot forward, and I think we have a really great best foot to put forward um, at the right time when parents are making kindergarten decisions. So I think a question that I have for you is what are our protocols and policies around fielding um, requests for information from incoming families as well as tours? So I would have to say I think that we're pretty informative to any parent who makes phone calls. Um, <clears throat> I don't get too many phone calls in my office. Um, Maria Ibrahim maybe gets them at the Parent Information Center. But I'd like to speak for the principals, if I may. Um, they are, if someone calls a principal and says, says that they're thinking about looking into going to that school, our principals will say to them that we'd be happy to talk to you. Would you like to come in and visit? There may be some problems around um, the timing of the visits, but our schools are very welcoming, and I know that all of the principals would say, we're happy to give you a tour of the school and show you what it's like. So I'm not sure where that is coming from, but um, as early as sometimes December and January, we get phone calls, and um, I'm sure that our principals always are responsive to their needs. So I'm not hearing that. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I'm assuming that that is happening in some cases, but I think there's a number of cases where that is also not happening. Um, so I guess the question is if we are hearing from families who are saying, I reached out in some way and I didn't get a response, do, who should we direct those folks so to? So it would be helpful for me to know okay. to whom they reached out. Okay. So if they Perfect. said, I reached out to the associate superintendent and she never called me back, then I would know. Okay. Um, but I would need to know who that person might be. Okay. I, mean, I just, it's perfect. It's hard for me to even think that our principals would not be responsive. <laughs> so. And I, I agree. Like, I've never personally had that experience. Um, however, I've seen it and been contacted by lots of people who have had that experience. And I just want to make sure that, particularly in that super anxious time, especially for like our first time families, that. Um, they get to see in action how amazing our programs are mm -hmm. um, before they are forced to make decisions to go somewhere else um, that may not necessarily be the best fit. So whether that is or not is, I think, for parents to decide um, in that context. But I also want to make sure that they don't make those decisions because they couldn't hear from us uh, or get their questions answered. Yeah, I would hope that they would at least contact me because that's where my four is. Yeah. And, uh, okay. So when people reach out to me, I will make sure that I direct them to you absolutely. in the future. Um, and then I also would like to make the motion that we refer our kindergarten orientation practices to the communications, community engagement, and strategic planning subcommittee for review. The subcommittee will review current communication and community engagement practices related to kindergarten orientation, and the subcommittee will report. Um, or recommend any revisions to the current plan and approach to the school committee here on, by no later than September 30th of 2020. Member Rousseau. Thank you. Um, I mean, I also have received these, and, and again, it's not my experience with the principals either. Um, I think that, you know, the day of... The, I've seen enough of what a principal has to do to know that it's a remarkable job that... <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do for all the money in the world. Um, and, um, you know, there's fires starting up every day in, in every building, um, not literal fires. Um, um, you know, emer <laughs> emergencies and crises that you have yeah. to deal with. Um, and I do dislike very much that we have to have the conversation that not prioritizing these incoming kindergarten parents or potential kindergarten parents who are being very actively recruited um, is going to cost us $12,700 a year for 13 years. Um, none of us are going to have an easier job in any of our buildings if we keep losing more and more kids. Um, and I just hate the idea that we have to say, you, you know, the message needs to be crystal clear to, from the administration down to the principals that these people need to be prioritized like, you know, like like the governor's at your front door. <laughs> it's like, because it's so much money. And they're making their choices on their first kid, and if they have four kids, all four are gonna go there. And it's just, we can't get them back. It's just so much money. Um, and I know it's 
in your day-to-day -day life as principals, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's kids here now and there's real problems you have to deal with. Um, and worrying about a kid that may or may not show up in September seems hard to prioritize, but um, we are losing so much money to the charter schools. So I just wanna urge everybody to sort of repeat this over and over again, um, that you know we have to have a, an incredibly robust and very, very strict protocol around when a kindergarten parent is interested we need to respond in a, in a very, very like excessive way almost, in my opinion, so. Okay, thank you. Member Van Der Kloot. Yes, um, it certainly um, makes it, I, I support the resolution. It sounds like where we're heading is that we're going to need to do some specialized um, preschool information, um, you know, directed to preschool um, uh, parents, especially, we have the Medford Family Network. We have parents we can outreach mm -hmm. to. And, um, you know, uh, I know one year I went and I was very disheartened by how many of those uh, parents, it just happened that year, were going to charter schools. So it, it seems like, um, with the feedback from my colleagues, that the um, that it's definitely time to think about an earlier outreach. I think that these presentations are great. I know the staff does a, a a fabulous job on them, um, but clearly uh, we're going to need to think about um, sooner. Sure. Member McLaughlin. I also support the resolution. Thank you. I just um, am wondering, though, um, um, Assistant Superintendent Caldwell, do we have data on how many kindergartners there are and how many we're actually are going choosing Medford Public Schools or choosing other schools? Do we even know that? We have data on, of course, the people that are coming, the children who sure. are coming to us. Um, I don't have any data of children going off to charter right. schools. So we don't even know really how much money we may or may not be losing, or do we? We do. Oh, we do. Because we have to pay it, right? Right. So we know. So are we getting retroactive data on that? That's what I'm asking. So Not to my knowledge. No. That would be interesting to... But it would be good for the school committee to know. And, the, and frankly, the you know, staff and assistant superintendent and principals, if we're talking about what, it, what these numbers really are translating into, and, you know, and people should know how great our schools are, because we do, right? We definitely do. Yeah. 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 Okay. Member Rousseau. I believe we know exactly how many students for each grade level, because we're, mm -hmm. while we're not actually cutting a check that we know because we didn't get the check um, from the state. So we know exactly that information. I believe it's even reported on the DESE website, although I'm not sure it's broken down by grade level. Uh, Ms. Patterson may actually know that. Yes, so the charter information is provided annually, and that is through the DESE portal. It is not active for um, any member of the community to just go and review, but we do have that access and that ability to pull by grade level. It's also noteworthy to understand that we have done outreach to the preschools that we did over the summer. We have been engaging at that level to reach out to our local uh, preschool providers in order to get the message out about Medford Public Schools. We've done flyers to the households that have identified and focused on the elementary schools themselves. So there has been outreach and we do continue to monitor this and try to actively uh, reach out to those families that this is um, not a new issue, a new item, but we are certainly reviewing that and trying to put our resources towards, um, again, maybe not recapturing those that are already there, but trying to uh, send the message of the greatness of Medford Public Schools for those that are on the cusp of making a decision. Thank you. Thank you. Mem Member McLaughlin? Yeah, just for a point of... Just point of clarification, if the, um, since the data is available or if it's available, that it could be referred to the subcommittee um, on this matter so that we could further drill down into that mm -hmm. as we're making some planning. Member Graham, would you mind reading your resolution one more time and we can vote on it? 
Thank you. So the, my, uh, I make a motion that the school committee refers our kindergarten orientation practices to the communications, community engagement, and strategic planning subcommittee for review. The subcommittee will also review current communication and community engagement practices related to kindergarten orientation. The subcommittee will recommend revisions to the current plan and approach to the school committee by September 30th, 2020. Perfect, thank you. Motion by Member Graham, seconded by... Um, that was a tie. Member, Mc <laughs> Member McLaughlin. <laughs> All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Report on draft of strategic plan by Dr. Maurice Edward Vincent. Oh, I'm going to slide, okay. This one be the... As the PowerPoint is being pulled up, I wanted to just share that this draft strategic plan has been a compilation of work that has taken place over the past year. Um, this work has been comprised of a, a diverse group of our district administrators. And um, in order to create this plan, um, we're gonna show it to you through a PowerPoint slide deck um, and I'm going to just highlight some of our key points. Um, I do want to make mention that a lot of the research from this refers back to my work with NISAP. And in NISAP, it's actually officially referred to as a strategy for district improvement. And we've abbreviated it to call it our strategic plan. The supporting documentation, as you can see, has been built upon our Medford Public Schools district improvement plans, existing DESE data, city and district surveys, district administrators feedback, the mayor's education transition subcommittee, subcommittee meeting that took place at the McGlynn School, and the Medford Mayoral Transition Committee recommendations. I do want to say that as this presentation takes place, I was going to hope that you would allow the entire team, as diverse administrators that you see hearing here, uh, here this evening, um, for us to be able to present the overview in full and then at the conclusion of our presentation that you can ask all of us questions because many of your questions may be responded, um, answered in the presentation that takes place. Um, the genesis of this plan, um, again, as I started to say, was from our new superintendent's induction program which is a three-year program that I am part of in a cohort of 40 superintendents across the Commonwealth. Um, this is a, a compilation and a reinvention of our, our existing Medford Public Schools district improvement plans. Um, the data also took place from leadership retreats and meetings that have taken place over the past year and this cross-disciplinary team of administrators that are here this evening, they represent both elementary, actually all, elementary, middle, and high school levels, special education, social emotional learning, curriculum, and central office. Our core values, when I came to Medford Public Schools, I talked about my core, core values of ACE, achievement, collaboration, and equity. 
Over the course of this year and working with the team, we've expanded that um, core value to also incorporate support. And this evening, as we give you the overview, you will see that our pillars, our core values, our achievement, collaboration, equity, and support. To give you an overview on achievement this evening, we have both Dr. Riccadelli and Headmaster Paul DeLeva, who are going to give you an overview of what achievement is all about. Is it possible to? Okay. There you go. Good evening. So our first core value tonight is that of achievement. We are a school district and educating children is what we do. It's very important. So as a school district, educating our youth and providing them with a quality education that challenges them and nurtures their growth is paramount to our mission. And therefore, the A in ACE stands for the core value of achievement. So when you look at everything, we've broken down into objectives as well as initiatives. And our objective for achievement is Medford Public Schools will develop and implement cohesive district-wide curricula and instruction assessed through various methods designed to help le learners reach their potential as knowledgeable, ethical, and critical thinking citizens. So when we look at achievement and we look at what's driving us, uh, the following initiatives um, are what we worked on and what we think we need to pursue. So we want to pursue instruction that focuses on evidence-based responses, on productive struggle, that is making our students stretch in their learning, academic discourse, them having those discussions that are, that are fruitful and, and um, rich in, in um, academic content. Um, we want them to be accessible for all. We want um, there to be rich feedback. So we call these five the five core actions. We've been doing a lot of professional development on the five core actions. We've been going into classes. We've been doing learning walks on these core actions. Uh, teaching in this manner and the, this way of instruction is important as we implement the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. If you look at the second initiative, uh, provide instructional technology that meets the curricula needs of educators and learners. Uh, we're not just looking for uh, instructional technology just for testing. In some cases, that's what we utilize it for, but we're also looking for ways to enhance our instructional practices so that they are different, uh, meeting the needs of everybody that can learn through different modes, me mediums, modalities, and all of that nature. So it's important that we assess what we're doing and having calm assessments and having benchmarks. The development are, the, are, are critically important so that we understand when we have success and when we need to try something else to reach success. Then the last initiative is to recruit and retain an effective and diverse staff. And if you look at uh, the demographics in Medford, uh, you want to make sure that you're having staff members that meet the needs of those students depending of where their backgrounds are or, or their learning styles or anything like that. So we really want to hone in on uh, recruiting and hiring staff here in Medford to meet those needs, those diverse needs. So one thing that is important that you haven't seen yet is that under the initiatives you're going to see that it looks like it's hyperlinked and it is hyperlinked. So the next step, and um, when we get to it, Assistant Superintendent um, Cushing is going to delve into that. So what you see are just the initiatives, but deeper into that, you're going to see that there really is a process, there's a template for each one of them. Thank you. I'm going to speak to the collaboration. So one of the goals, our objective, is to foster collaborative relationships. So the Medford Public Schools will create a culture of collaboration through consistent community engagement. That is our goal, that is our objective, and uh, we have several initiatives that we are going to propose in order to accomplish our objective. 
First one is to build mutually beneficial community partnerships in order to increase school effectiveness. Second one is to actively ensure that all families are welcome members of the school community who contribute to the classroom, school, and community effectiveness. The third one, which Dr. Cushing will delve into a little bit later on with the hyperlink, so this is one of the examples Dr. Riccadelli spoke to earlier that we are going to um, you know, go ahead and present to, is to engage in timely, thoughtful, to a culturally proficient communication with the Medford Mustang community. And then finally, our last initiative is to work collaboratively with community stakeholders to funnel appropriate budgetary resources. Once again, trying to work collaboratively with one another in order to get the best resources for our students. So I'm going to turn it over to the uh, e-equity team. Good evening, that would be me, Suzanne Galusi, Principal of the Brooks. Um, the E in our ACES core objectives stands for equity. Uh, within education, the term equity means that every student will get what they need. Uh, therefore, Method Public Schools fosters equitable learning environments by understanding the needs of our diverse population and supporting the academic, social, emotional, and physical needs of our students. We have four initiatives to address this objective. Please remember that these initiatives are a work in progress. So the first is to ensure equitable access through the implementation of the multi-tiered system of support and enrichment, MTSSE, -E, excuse me, formerly known as RTI. To encompass a growth mindset, this initiative has expanded our focus beyond just RTI, which stands for Response to Intervention. So in other words, an MTSSE system is not just limited to interventions. It also focuses on meeting the social, emotional, and physical needs of our learners. The second uh, initiative is to use data from ongoing assessments to support teaching and learning in order to close the achievement gap. This will be a comprehensive approach within school buildings and throughout the district. Promote and enhance the activities and resources that address the needs of the whole child. Um, it should be noted that when addressing the needs of the whole child, we're looking at the complete picture of what that means. Um, and that will encompass multiple intelligences, athletics, fine arts, etc. And to promote the health and wellness of students. Uh, when students are happy and healthy they're, and their needs are met, they're ready to learn. And this segues beautifully into our final core value, um, the S of support, which Susanna Campbell and Stacey Schulman will discuss. Support is our foundational core value. Originally, we started with three core values, achievement, collaboration, and equity. We decided to add support as our foundational core value since we recognize that in order to meet our achievement, collaboration, and equity core value objectives, we must provide safe and supportive environments for our students. We considered Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which indicates that in order to achieve, individuals must have their more fundamental needs met, including food, safety, and a sense of belonging. Our team intentionally chose the color green for this level to represent a safe, calm, welcoming, and supportive learning environment. Our objective states, to foster a safe and supportive learning environment, Medford Public Schools will continually assess, review, and provide a safe, secure teaching and learning environment. Ms. Schulman will now review the initiatives that correspond to this core value. Good evening. Under support, we have five initiatives. The first is to continue to use and refine consistent safety protocols. Secondly, we have to increase supports and also the understanding for the social emotional needs of Medford students. We also have sustain and build upon partnerships with community safety stakeholders and use evidence-based practices to develop a positive school culture. Lastly, to audit and improve the physical infrastructure of all of our school buildings. Dr. Cushing will now provide an in-depth example of the action plans behind each of these initiatives. So what I'm handing out to you right now um, is a fully fleshed out document that 
expands upon the template that you have. Every single, let me get to the microphone. So every single hyperlink that you see on the first page of the strategic plan leads to a specific action plan. Um, within that action plan, there is the header that lists 2020 to 2023 strategic uh, plan phase one. So as we enter phase one, all right, these are the primary objectives and initiatives that we see as fundamentally important. And so each one will have fostering collaborative relationships for this one, and this is initiative three. This is the third one listed. And then they will each list the initiative again. And then there are four critical elements here. So what are our early indicators of success? What are the resources needed? What are our anticipated or hoped outcomes? And who's the project manager? So who are we looking to to make sure that we're accountable for our initiatives and then the action items underneath. So here you can see early indicators of success quickly, establish a district Marcom, marketing communications plan, establishing district controlled social media accounts, uh, new website deployed, interestingly enough, that just actually happened, uh, and district-wide smartphone application, something that is currently in the works. Uh, the resources needed, obviously, financial appropriations, community input, social media sites, and SIMS, which stands for um, School Information, Student Information Management System Support and Training. So that ongoing training and support to basically use um, our SIMS system. Um, and then our anticipated outcomes, um, improved experiences, uh, ex improved communication with caregivers and stakeholders, increased trust and support, uh, pick uh, streamlined to onboard families quickly and seamlessly as possible. And then you move down to the lower portion of the page. Uh, this can be one page, it can be two pages, it's whatever the action items need. It gives specifically what the action item is, what the initial desired outputs are, who the responsibility is. Uh, we've gone with titles here. Um, to make sure that if there's transition, that we're not having to go back and change individuals, but we're focusing on titles. And then specific timelines for when things will be completed or when major milestones should be met. Um, it's focused, um, it's driven on outputs and timeliness, and once again, who's working underneath the overall project manager, all right, to provide specifics. Um, my eyesight in my later years is failing me. You have it right there, but you can see specifics of the things that we are fleshing out. Um, this, is, this is like many that are at a, um, a good level of development. There are others that do need some work, um, but that we have been focusing on and have been working diligently on uh, in the development. Mr. Deleva. Um, so, in education, there's a lot of jargon and a lot of edu-speak. And if you'll notice on the very first page that you were given, uh, down in the lower left-hand corner, there's another hyperlink for a glossary of terms. And so this just gives you an example of the Medford edu-speak glossary of terms that is being developed by members of our staff. This has been shared out with Tony Ray, with Jen Hollenbach, with principals, with other directors, other people, and it will continue to be shared out so that we can refine and provide the best um, definition. One, let me give you one example of a very Medford specific that's up there, is credit for life. So that has been shared out with Gail Trainer. Gail Trainer has provided a more in-depth def definition than what is currently up there um, as the online document is being continuously updated and I know that she worked on that this past Friday. Um, but so if people ask, what is a 504? What is a BCBA? What is an IEP later in the document? These things are defined specifically so that as people are reading the document, things that may come up they don't have to go searching for in other places. They don't have to Google search. They can if they want, but it's provided for them. Um, and so that gives us um, a real opportunity to, for transparency in our language and not to try to hide things in jargon.
So what we have now is what are our next steps for engagement? As you can see, our core values are in the middle and our intention for engagement is to engage all that's listed, to engage our subcommittee that will be addressing strategic planning, the school committee, our community at large, faculty and staff, caregivers, and school leaders. Um, the C for collaboration, working together, making this a shared experience, a living document um, that we will all be able to refer to and to really make it something that when we talk about Medford Public Schools and we talk about our Mustang country, that people will also be able to say that we represent ACEs and what that stands for. Um, we would like to market this widely and really have it owned by the entire community at large. And so our tagline for ACEs, what we're committed to, our core values, our four pillars, our achievement, collaboration, equity, and support. I open the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Superintendent, Administrators. Do we have any questions? Uh, Member Van de Kloot. Yes, so uh, thank you for all the work to the team who's been putting and working on this document. Um, just uh, for our clarity, I believe my understanding is that for each of the bullets, um, you'd hyperlink to a page that would outline in detail uh, the steps needed to achieve and the um, person in, uh, in charge. Um, of the bullets that we have here, roughly 16, 17, um, uh, how many have we done that next step for? Um, or is, uh, is, that just, is, that, is that the next step? So um, different initiatives are at different levels of completion as this is a fluid document in terms of initiatives that are taking place right now um, and initiatives that we would like to do in the future. Um, so it is a fluid document. That some may be, you know, 80 percent um, completed. The, the sample that Dr. Cushing shared about um, two-way communication. Um, so they are at different levels of completion because we know that um, it is a fluid document, it is a work in pro progress, but again, looking at all the data that was available and taking everything that Medford Public is doing and espouses to do and trying to bring it into one document where we're able to state our core values, we're able to say this is the work that we're doing, to have this be our guiding, driving document as a district, um, that, that I feel is the majority of the work that has taken place. And any member of this wonderfully um, gifted group of administrators that I get to work with, um, feel free to um, add to uh, my remarks. If I can just follow up, mm -hmm. moving forward, what do you envision now? Sending it, do you envision it going to the uh, subcommittee? Um. So we do have professional development uh, scheduled tomorrow with all administrators. This group of diverse administrators that you see here um, took on a lot of the um, <coughs> the work of pulling together multiple initiatives and things that are taking place in the district. The larger administrative team um, meets monthly, and so this is also going to be presented to them um, at this state um, tomorrow, and we know that we will also be prepared to um, start meeting with the uh, subcommittee as we continue to um, flesh this out and 
continue to build the glossary of terms. Um, this was really an opportunity because there was a lot of questions about what was the st strategic plan, what were we working on, um, what does it represent, and I really wanted the opportunity to present it to this entire body for you to see that this is a culmination of a year's work um, and where we are right now. So I would see us having a little bit more additional administrator input on some of the initiatives, knowing that it's not complete, that it will be a fluid document. It's a multi-year document. It's very ambitious. Um, there are some things that will be able to happen immediately, like our um, website that was able to just be launched, but it's that too is still going to be tweaked and there are other things that we have to um, schedule further out. So it will be fluid, but um, it will be a kind of roadmap to guide the work that we are doing and will um, aspire to do in the future. Thank you. Um, so to answer your question too regarding um, the action items, which are filled or not, I think what, what I wanted to state was when we started this, we were looking at things that we previously had um, and so it's sort of been a build from what we've previously had, things that we had done when uh, Dr. Vincent had come in to the district. So this has been a long going process and a, uh, there's a lot of initiatives that Medford had, you know, had down, but I don't think we were as organized as we probably could be. And this is really kind of honing down into directly what needs to be addressed and giving us timelines, sorry. Uh, it's given us timelines and things like that, so we're making sure that uh, it's not just a document that's been said, it's something that we're following and we're updating every year if we need to. So I just wanted to kind of throw that. It's a grander picture all the way through. The other, two, the other thing, too, that's really important as the team, as we've been working together, is the thing we've realized is there are, there are a tremendous amount of things that need to be done. And the question is, is what is the capacity to actually carry these things out in a very good fashion? And so um, while it's 2020 to 2023, we're looking at things in almost an 18 month block and then 18 months out to that three years. And like, how do we actually build the timelines and the action items so that we don't create an impossible task? but we create things that can be achieved, can be done very well, and can show marked results to student improvement. Um, everything in here is about improving the student experience um, and making sure that student outcomes are what we see improved, and for lack of saying in a lot of words, for all students, that we ensure that all students regardless of who they are, regardless of their ability level, regardless of anything, that this plan speaks to them, um, speaks to their caregivers, and speaks to our ability as a district to have the capacity to achieve greatness for them. Thank you. We have our student rep, Mr. Mark Allen Jean Mary, who'd like to ask a question go ahead okay so I was looking at the mission statement and the, a part that really caught my attention was the the um, focus on full academic and personal potential but I was looking at it more on the family basis and what that would mean for a family that might not have English as a first language personally as like an interpreter I go and usually interpret for families that might not have English as a first language and I feel like the, um, what would be like the improvements that, that are being made to have a sort of point person for these families to refer to? Because um, as uh, as school committee member Vanderclou was saying, it's it's important to get to get um, the support early on mm -hmm. to make sure that they feel that they have the support support early on. And um, as um, Paul Russo was saying, um, that decision can affect the 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 children not because the parents make the decision based on the first children, that could also affect what that would look like for the second, third, fourth, and that might make, that might make them change the decision as to putting this, the kids in Medford public school system. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really in, important to like look at that aspect of how do we support them better earlier on. So. Great question. I don't know. Does anybody have the answer to that? <laughs> it's, it's an action item that, I mean, it's, 
As you know in the document, I know it seems general in the front, Mark, but uh, what we try to do is we try to isolate those things in our action items. So on the second sheet that Dr. Cushion showed you, there's going to be a link for uh, support on that end of it as well. And it would probably be, from the chair, it would probably be a lot in, in the communication aspect, right. um, how we give out communication, make sure it's ensuring that it's in different languages, like Dr. Vincent had mentioned. So um, I'm sure you're working on that yeah, absolutely. absolutely but great question thank you thank you all right so, so I just I, if I can just try to answer your question okay. so um, as we mentioned we have hyperlink um, strategic a strategic plan for each one of these so if you look under fostering equitable learning environments mm -hmm. and you look at the initiatives if you go down to one two th the third bullet um, I believe this is where this is where we're, I'm not sure if this one was, was finished. I know we have the discussion. But promote and enhance activities and resources that address the needs of the whole child. So the resources. So a resource would be um, the translation, um, anything that would help a student access the curriculum. So I think what's important to note is that we wordsmithed each one of these over and over and over. We met many hours. Each word here may look on the face of it like, you know, oh, it's, you know, resource or, you know, but, but I, I do want to tell you that each word in here really is loaded with a specific meaning. So when you brought up that question, the first thing that jumped to me was that, that equitable learning environment. So that would be a resource that the district would want to provide to its students, its families, to make it accessible to, to them. Okay. And Dr. Cadelli, too, um, under fostering collaborative relationships, um, engage in timely, thoughtful, two-way, culturally proficient communication with the Medford yes. Mustang community. So I bet there will be a number of links that relate to. Yes. Um, we, you're, you're absolutely correct. There are a number of places where there's there's some duality, where there's some some crossover. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Mayor Lago calling. Uh, took the words right out of my mouth. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Member Graham. Thank you guys for all of your work so far. I am really excited that we are pursuing a strategic planning effort as a district. I feel like we've heard about a lot of strategic plans or the need for strategic plans in Medford over the last few months. And I really do believe that it's because we are sort of at this proverbial tipping point where we all recognize that we cannot continue without a strategic plan. Our strategic plan is an important roadmap and not something we can or should expect to come together quickly or easily, as you guys know, because you've been at this for quite some time. Um, but with our strategic plan process, we have an opportunity to listen to our many constituents and revisit things we've long accepted, including things like our, simply our mission statement. Our strategic plan, when it is completed, is also an overarching communication to the community about who we are, where we are going, and when we will get there. It allows us to be open and transparent about what we plan to do and when. It also sets the foundation for us all when the community asks, have we ever thought about X or what does Medford do about Y? It will allow us to say, yes, we have thought about X and we're going to complete that in year 20, fill in the blank, because before we can get there, we have to do A, B, and C for that to be meaningful. Um, perhaps most importantly, it provides guidance to our spending choices so that we can spend wisely and we can have real dialogue about the resources we need to execute the plans accelerate certain parts or add new ideas to it. So I want to thank you guys for all of this work and I'm super excited that I get to be the chair of the communications, <laughs> community engagement and strategic planning subcommittee as we embark on this effort. Um, I would like to make a motion to move this draft strategic plan to that committee so that we can start that process of that more in-depth look and um, work um, on our discussion around strategic planning and the entire process moving forward. Sounds great. Seconded by um, Member McLaughlin. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? We've got a busy committee, <laughs> Ms. Graham. <laughs> I'm closed for business after this, <laughs> after this meeting. <laughs> Tap out, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Member McLaughlin. Thank you all very much for this. I can see that there's a lot of hard work put into it. I love the Edge Speak. 
right? We've had lots of conversations about that over time and um, send it to all the grad schools around town, please. No. Um, but no, the edge speak is really important, especially when families are having conversations and you know the, the acronyms roll off our tongues like we don't even notice um, anymore. And it's really important for people to be able to stop and remind us that we can tell them um, what those acronyms mean. So thank you for including that. I think the hyperlinks are really great. I'm glad to see it. I'm excited that I'm also on the subcommittee. So I'll be excited to um, be working with folks. I did have a couple of questions. I wanted to ask how you guys were chosen as district administrators to work on this particular strategic plan. Um, was it, were you self, did you self select? Did they volunteer self select? So, were you chosen? Like, how did that work? What was that so process? So, earlier this year in September, um, we really started to look at the, the best ways in using strategy in action and other resources, the best way to really move a, um, a strategic plan forward. Um, because when you have a lot of voices, a lot of times the actual work becomes. Uh, substantially more difficult to initially get off the ground. And so, Especially when you're wordsmithing everything. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you, there was a, as my brother the attorney once said, there's a reason why people argue over the meaning of the word the. Yeah. Um, but I'll be honest, um, we asked for people to self-select, people that were going to be able to dedicate two and three hours at a time out of their day, in the afternoon, whenever it may be, um, to really dedicate themselves to this work and this, this is the group who stepped forward. Um, it was open um, to, it was open to anyone to reach out, to come to us. Um, we did a Google form asking for people, um, trying to find the best availability uh, and then we just really had to hunker down and look at the documents, look at the data and to really look at the things that came before this and to be able to work together as a team to craft this. And um, it's been a really amazing journey thus far, especially for someone who just came on board. Thank you. Team, we thank have a you. resident and parent who would like to speak. Just name and address for the record. Yeah, um, Sharon Hayes, 69 Ripley Road. Um, I had a question about one specific thing that was mentioned. Um, the replacement for the response to intervention, um, that was really a huge rollout, I remember, at least, la was it last year or the year before? And I, I know I was specifically very interested in it because as an educator myself, I've been involved in response and intervention in other uh, cities and towns, and it's a really good process for identifying students who need extra support and then making sure you follow up in a set amount of time to see if they need to go further, if they need more support, if they need um, to be tested for special education so I'm a little concerned to hear that that's being dropped or being morphed into something else well I guess I guess I'm wondering is there going to be a description of what that is because I've never heard of this new one I don't know if it's specific to Medford or not but like I said I know the response to intervention I know it works well so personally I'm a little concerned to hear it's being well, am I allowed to answer changed this yes all right to share the, okay. the thank you so I, so MTSSE yeah. it is is like an umbrella Okay. And so RTI fits underneath. So we're not we're not dropping RTI, but RTI is is more academic based, mm -hmm. and it focuses on what students need academically. We want to think about the whole child, and we also want to have systems in place to address the social, emotional, or physical needs. So in addition, in addition to RTI, yes. yeah. okay. as well as the enrichment needs too. Yeah. Right. Is it going to be a similar? We speak in the microphone just so the. If we could. So MTSS is also on the DESI website, and they give a nice description of the different tiers of intervention. In, in, just so the people at home can. Sorry. Can, can, MTSS is also on the DESI website, and it gives a nice description of how the process works. It's tiered intervention. So tier one would be what happens in gen ed for all students. And then as students need more support through screening or through classroom observation, they're given more supports and you kind of watch them in progress monitor to see how they're doing and then if they need more intervention on top of that, you continue to provide it until you give them the amount of intervention they need to be successful. You're not just looking at academics, which was really where RTI started. But RTI is still alive and well. It's just an aspect of MTSS. 
Now what makes MTSS E special is that we've decided to go one step further and to really think about enrichment because there are students who might be having their needs met in gen ed but maybe they need more maybe they can do more maybe we could push them further so we're looking to at enrichment as well does that help answer your question it, it does I'm kind Sharon of you can come on up and <laughs> yep um, and if this is probably more, maybe it's going to be discussed at another meeting in more depth. I just know that there were a lot of questions and issues with how to even implement the RTI piece of it in terms of having staffing to do all of the pieces of it in terms of, you know, doing the, going into the classrooms, doing observations, and then providing whatever supports were needed. So, again, I'm just curious now that it's going to be even a broader uh, process or include more types of, of interventions or more types of needs, how that's going to be implemented given that I, my understanding was RTI has not even been completely implemented yet, the, the academic piece of it. So that's kind of what I'm wondering. I don't know if there's going to be another meeting to talk about it in more depth. Mm -hmm. um, but more thank you. Right. And you'll see, you will see more of that, the answers to your questions in the action plans that are linked to the initiatives. So it will be laid out in a way that you can see how do we get there. Because we've been having those discussions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Member McLaughlin. Yeah, I just had a small. Yeah, I just had a small point of, um, I guess, a question, and I'm sure you guys, some of you guys, have thought about this, but I'm wondering how you're going to address it or how you want the community to address. So um, the acronym's great for the strategic plan, but as you know, um, especially Stacy, that that has a whole other meeting in uh, in childhood trauma. Um, and so how do we, how, you know, I, I think about the differentiation of that. So ACES is also the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, which is a very large study on childhood trauma and um, the effects of childhood trauma on, on you know, children's long-term effects on their lives and so on and so forth. So did that come up in your conversations at all? Sure, and that would be addressed under um, the latter part, which is increased support and understanding for the social emotional needs of Medford students. Right. Well, the acronym had been brought in by Dr. Edward Vincent, um, and this was an enhancement of that with support. Um, I think that, you know, spelling it out at the end will hopefully, and as well as in the logo itself, will help people sort of differentiate that. Oh, oh did you touch the mitten? You're on now. Certainly, and perhaps that's something we should add to our glossary of terms. Yeah, we'll just 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 to sort of that. clarify that. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Member Graham. So, <clears throat> having heard Sharon's question and Melanie's question. I feel like the answer to both of these questions is that we have to be both patient and impatient at exactly the same time. Um, none of these things can happen by June, July. Like, small things can happen, but we're talking about moving a massive organization in a totally specific direction, and that takes a tremendous amount of time in the best of situations, resources are not an issue, and you can just commit to moving in that direction, but we have sort of added complication that we, we do not have endless resources um, to execute on every single thing that we want. So sort of patience and impatience um, is an interesting balance to have to strike when you do strategic planning. I think the other thing that happens often when you do strategic planning in any capacity is what you thought was done is often really just the beginning. So something like an acronym, when you start talking to other people, you may find that that acronym really just doesn't speak to people. And I think I want us all to be open to the fact that this is the beginning of a process um, that is going to take some time and um, willingness to say we're not going to leave any stone unturned. And that may mean that we turn the stone over like four or five times before we land. Thank you. Motion, we, we already took the motion to send it to subcommittees. 
So thank you all for being here and for your presentation. It was great. Thank you. Thank you to our superintendent for leading the effort. Um, do we have any old business? We did vote. We did. No, we're gonna we're gonna go get through this. Okay. If there's no old old business, uh, is there any communications? Yes. Member McLaughlin. Um, regarding uh, communications, a few things. One was um, I wanted to make a motion for um, school committee member updates um, as part of our um, weekly or um, bi-monthly meetings, so that. Uh, the community and um, each other can know what each school committee member is working on. So I'm making a motion under the communications to have uh, school committee member updates. A motion by M Member McLaughlin, seconded by Member Stone. All those in favor? Paper passes. I have a. I have another motion for under McLaughlin. communication. Thank you. Um, I also have. Heard, you know, I've been coming to meetings for years um, in the audience and I appreciate those of you that are still out there. Thank you. I know how tiring it can be um, sitting out there and watching all night. Um, but there's been a lot of conversation over years um, about providing materials that are in our packets to the public whenever possible. So mm -hmm. obviously we wouldn't be providing materials that are confidential, but you know, there's a lot of material here that's very useful. Um, I also wanted to ask if we could get a copy of the PowerPoint from tonight, just because it's helpful for cross for um, referencing in the past. But I'd like to make a motion that we are able to create uh, weekly school committee packets for the community that are online and available um, so that the community can access what we're talking about because having sat on the other side of that railing I know that it's um you're getting bits and pieces of the information but it's really helpful to have things in front of you or to be able to look at it in advance so that if you have any questions in the future and so yeah. I'm making a motion I, to put that material online from the chair I believe we d we did discuss this one of our first get-togethers so hopefully uh, uh, minutes agendas and commit reports um, be, be posted on the website but let's take another motion by M member McLaughlin seconded by member Stone all those in favor aye all those opposed paper passes thank you um, I, I do have a, a concern in terms of um, the demand and the time frame because some of the reports are, are being generated in almost real time um, to get the packets to you on Friday. And because things are being added, and I know it's something that may end up going to the rules subcommittee, but there will definitely need to be like a clear um, cutoff time in order to get it done because the same exact administrators that you see who are still here this evening, mm -hmm. they actually have um, other jobs and responsibilities where they're in the field servicing students mm -hmm. and the amount of time that some of the reports take mm -hmm. requires them to stop doing the other work in order mm -hmm. to do that. So I just want to be um, realistic in saying that um, we're going to get it like to get them printed in color and ready to be delivered to you, the entire school committee, by Friday evening, and to have it um, select portions of the um, reports online that there will need to probably be some kind of timeline that's generated in order for that to realistically um, be done. I, I just want to um, state that honestly. Sure, I, I think that it's reasonable. I assume that the reports are being provided electronically, right? So not printed. So that I mean, I'm just imagining that if there's a, and again, I'm not sure of processes, but if there's a an electronic report that's going to administration, then once the report is reviewed, obviously by by central administration, what have you, then it also gets forwarded to the webmaster or whoever to put together these packets. Um, that can be available on, you know, by Monday or whenever so that people mm -hmm. have it before the meeting. I wouldn't expect simultaneously, but okay. I'm assuming the reports are all sent electronically anyway, so it's sort of just another step in procedure. And maybe it goes to the, um, 
to the um, policy subcommittee just to figure out what the actual procedure is, what that looks like. Um, and I'm happy to refer to that just in terms of how we want to step it so that you have a timeline that's reasonable because we definitely aren't interested in giving people more work. I'm not interested in giving people more work. I really just want to share information. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Through the chair, could it be uploaded on Monday by our webmaster? I think Monday would be reasonable. Yes. Member Mastone. That's what I was going to suggest because I know you're at the wire on Friday night, but I think even if they're uploaded by 5 o'clock on Monday, people yeah, can check sure. it out or, you know, have it with them when they're on their phone here. Mm -hmm. So. Or even follow along from the right. audience. Absolutely. Uh, great. Any new business? Here we go. Oh, you're up. Re reorganization of our subcommittees. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Mayor Van de Kloot. Um, I, uh, now, now that we've officially, that. you're promoted. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> wow, that was easy. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, I didn't so, my, my brain. 10, 10 p.m. <laughs> yes. no. So uh, give, given that we are now official, I'd like to um, announce that the curriculum subcommittee is going to meet on Wednesday um, at 6 o'clock between 6 and 7. Um, we are meeting at the uh, request of uh, Associate Superintendent Diane Caldwell for a presentation on enhanced core reading instruction. Um, we did the unusual step of going ahead and setting up the meeting uh, prior to sending it to the subcommittee officially from this body um, because of a timeline issue. So I hope that no one has any uh, concern or objection. Um, so that will be on this Wednesday, February 5th um, at 6 o'clock up at the high school. Thank you. Thank also, you. while we're under this, mm -hmm. um, I noticed that we haven't yet uh, received any appointees to the vision committee, and I just want to ask the mayor what her intention was yes. about that. Um, superintendent sent me, gave me the package without Thursday or Friday yeah. of last week. It is hopefully going to be done by the end of the week. There are 41 Ooh, applicants, mm -hmm. which is a lot of people. Um, I, we're talking of a committee of 11, between 11 and 13. Um, we just want to make sure it's done as fair as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member McLaughlin. So to that, thank you. So to that, to that end, Thank you, um, Paul, uh, Member Van Der Kloot, for the uh, information on the enhanced uh, reading this Wednesday uh, for the curriculum subcommittee. Um, and uh, I'm assuming that that's this Wednesday, this time. It's not Wednesdays all the time, or okay, yeah. Just want to make sure. I'm thinking of like CPAC and other things that are happening. On no, not this week. Second Wednesday. Yeah, thank you. And then the other is um, regarding the high school vision committee um, and the 41 applicants when you're talking about there's 11 to 13 and you want it to be as fair as possible. So to that end, are you, gonna th are you thinking about, uh, I'm wondering what, how that fairness is possible. Is it a lottery? Is it um, you're looking at different age levels? You're looking at different schools, grades? Like how? Um, one or two school committee members, one or two administration from the administration, um, maybe a parent from each level. I haven't done it fully in my head, but also there are a number of parents and also professionals in the industry. So I want to make sure I, one engineer, one architect, is, I haven't weeded through them all, but I just kind of look to see how many, um, but along those lines. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, resolution by offered by Member Rousseau. Given the creation of ad hoc reports at the behest of the school committee can require substantial effort on the part of the office of the superintendent and her staff and that the school committee often depends on these ad hoc reports to assist in deliberations, the Rules, Policy, and Equity Subcommittee shall generate a new rule for the school committee to guide how ad hoc reports requests are generated. Motion for approval, Motion for approval by Member Van de Kloot, seconded by Second. Member Kretz. All those in favor? All those opposed? Pay. 
Member McLaughlin. Yes. So, um, thank you. I just have a question. So, if the rules and so it so what I'm understanding this is saying is that um, the rules policy and equity subcommittee will make will help devise policy on how reports are requested. Um, is that accurate, Member Russo? Um, we will. Would, you are on the subcommittee, but we will get together yes. and we will draft a new rule, not a policy, mm -hmm. um, that will tell all of us how we shall request ad hoc reports. Okay. Um, of course, once we have that recommendation, we bring it back here to vote on it, right. and you can all say that hopefully you'll agree with that rule. Um, and then that will be the rule for, so we'll, they'll, you know, the intention of this is that nobody will be here saying like, I'd like a report and just start rattling off what you want. And, you know, we can get in, in the subcommittee, we can go into the, the gory details of what's so horrible about that. Um, simple reports might actually require 40 hours of labor, just so you can ask a simple question. <laughs> um, and that might be okay, but I don't think when we approve those reports, we all realize what we're doing to the superintendent's office. And I might not be so willing to approve a report request if I thought, that if new, for instance, that answering your question requires an obscene amount of work. Um, so that, that's sort of the whole genesis of this, because we, we have a long list of ad hoc reports um, and no idea, because they haven't probably even been started, I'm assuming, but we don't know. Are, are these reports that are simple and like somebody clicks a button in some software program, or are these reports that take weeks of staff's effort to answer questions? By the way, our reports right now, well, they don't even know what the question is we're trying to answer. So, I mean, I think it's important we have, you know, a simple form. What do you want to know? Why do you want to know it? So we're not playing gotcha with the administration, um, digging up lots of data so we can try and find something somebody did wrong or something. Um, and then get an estimate from the administration. What does it really take to do this report so that we can, I'm sort of just telling you what I want to do in the subcommittee. But you know, that, that's the genesis of this, is that it's just too easy to rattle off a report and think that we have like 40 people sitting around in central administration running off to do our work for us and that they don't exist, so. Thank you. But I'm glad you're on the subcommittee, because. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad I'm on it too. <laughs> Thank right. you. Um, yeah, that's good. Um, so, but in, I'm assuming there'll be a process for whatever reports were requested, obviously, as well, that there's a timeline or whatever, because a lot of these are from, and again, since they're from 2019, at this point, it's I'm back to November of 2019 or April or October or whatever, 2019, that there'll be questions, like you said, there'll be some documentation of why these reports were requested, and that's reported out to the, the public about why the reports are being requested. If yeah, and I, I think they, these existing reports, for the most part, um, especially the older ones, I don't think any of us are going to be able to answer those questions. And we can just vote to take them off the list. Or, yeah, okay. Or, or keep them on the list if we can imagine why the report is here. I mean, get a list of uh, out of district student enrollment in Medford Public Schools. I'm guessing that is like how many? We, we aren't going to get a list of the actual students. No, I wouldn't uh, imagine that you'd get the list of the actual students, but I think that is really inform interesting information just in terms of how many, how much, you know, other yeah. things. But so, okay, so there's going to be a process is sort of what I'm understanding yeah. instead of just asking. So that's helpful, and I assume that that process will include a timeline and reporting out to the public as the subcommittee would need to do. Is yeah, that right? This, this will just be to generate a rule that we will then follow as a committee if we approve the rule. And the subcommittee will report out that rule. The recommendation. To the recommendation. recommendation. The rule, yep. mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> to the full committee where it can be changed or amended and then voted on. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Motion for approval by Ms. Mirange includes, seconded by Ms. Kretz. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. Offered by Vice Chair Rousseau, given that several periodic reports are required by law, regulation, past practice, and best practice, the Rules, Policy, and Equity Subcommittee shall prom promulgate an annual schedule of such reports to provide the superintendent, the school committee, and the public a transparent and concise understanding of when to expect these reports. Motion for approval by Member Van de Kloot, seconded by Ms. Graham, Member Graham. All those in favor? Aye. Paper passes. 
offered by myself um, be resolved the administration provide the school committee with an update report on dyslexia during our 224 meeting and all the changes that have taken place since June to improve how we test and treat. May I ask you a question? Yes. Sure. This is one of those circumstances where we have a meeting immediately after a vacation week. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. so given that timeline, is, um, is that meeting the best meeting to do that? Is, are, are, we, are you prepared at that point? Um, this is a very lengthy um, process, so we've actually started um, gathering the data. So. By the time we get to the 24th, we should be ready to um, make a to presentation. Go. But it's been ongoing. It's yes, yes, I know. A, a very long process. Right. I only raise it only because of the uh, the fact it is right after, and you know, some people are on vacation, but not mm -hmm. all. Anyway, thank you, and I would support it. Uh, so, motion for approval. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Superintendent. Um, Member McLaughlin. Oh, second of the motion. But also, um, yeah, so that, I'm just asking, Yours sorry. Yours is sticking, I'm sorry, it's just yeah. not. So this, tell me when you, tell me when it's on like this. Okay. Just not working. Yep, there you there go. it goes, yep, now I see it. Like, Thank you, go ahead, Rudolph. remember. Um, so this would be an example of, uh, in the future, something that would have to go through this, the policy, what, yeah, the rules this request, right? No. That resolution uh, that the mayor offered for the report on dyslexia, that would be one, again, that would not be offered in this format. It would be offered in whatever the policy subcommittee or rules subcommittee decides. We haven't voted on anything the rules no, I know. recommends. So no, but I just mean that. in the future. I'm trying to use an example. Is that right? I didn't understand it that way either. So, um, member Vandekly, or point of sending it to the subcommittee is so you can argue it out there about saying what makes sense to send. What's an ad hoc report, and does something like this qualify? And how do you how do you discern? So that's kind of my my thinking about it is that there'll be uh, multiple interesting discussions about this. That's, that's why it's going to subcommittee. Uh, not, not, this, uh, not this resolution, the, what she's referring to with the ad hoc reports, Mayor. Future resolutions. Yeah, future resolutions. Does that have to be checked? Well, you're going to have to figure that out. <laughs> subcommittee will discuss mm -hmm. that. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right answer, but... Okay. Number seven, school committee resolution offered by Vice Chair Rousseau, a resolution in support of the Healthy Youth Act, for H410, whereas comprehensive health education reduces sexual assault and harassment, whereas it is important to educate children about how to build healthy, respectful relationships, whereas all children deserve medically, medically accurate education, whereas the diversity of hunger gen gender expression is non-binary, whereas it is the responsibility of our public schools to educate all children, and whereas underrepresented sexual and gender minorities are disproportionately affected by inadequate health education, now therefore be it resolved that the Medford School Committee of Medford support the passage of House Bill 410 in action relative to healthy youth urges the Massachusetts House of Representatives to bring this bill to a vote and sends a letter of support to the Honorable Speaker DeLeo, the Honorable Mr. Donato, the Honorable Mr. Garbley, and the Honorable Miss Barber. Member Rousseau. I would like to amend this to fix uh, the, uh, after resolve that says an action relative to, it should be an act relative to healthy youth. Um, but um, I've actually, I'm sorry. Um, and um, I have actually offered this last year, and it was passed as well. Um, the House continues to not actually take it up for a vote, even though the Senate passes it, um, I believe, even unanimously in their last vote, or close to unanimous, unanimously. 
I'm sure there were a couple of holdouts. Um, so this is not a controversial piece of legislation, unless, of course, you control who get what we actually vote on in the legislature. Um, all this would do is require that public schools that do offer sexual uh, health education actually do it an accurate and correct job. Um, if communities opt to not teach any sex ed at all, um, they can continue to pretend that life doesn't include this stuff. So um, I urge us to um, approve this and send this off to these folks to remind them that we actually do want this to pass. Motion for approval by Member Graham. Second. Seconded by Member Rousseau. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, all those opposed? Paper passes. Thank you. We have school safety and procedural update offered by Member McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, so I had uh, had an agenda request um, for a school safety procedural update um, be added to the agenda, and it was uh, unfortunately mis uh, put under requested reports. I'm not looking for a report um, per se. I'm looking for an update. I, don't, I hope that doesn't constitute a report, but I think um, given the circumstances of the past um, two weeks with the question of um, you know, process and protocol around this um, unidentified powder, which thankfully was resolved. And thank you all for your hard work on that. I know that that was a lot of hours and energy and input. Um, but understanding, and I, and, and I think it's a longer conversation than, you know, anybody has, than certainly I have the brain power for tonight. So I'd ask that this be moved to an agenda item for um, the next so table school committee meeting, yeah. As an agenda item. Motion to table as an agenda item till 224, seconded by Member Rousseau. All those in favor? All Aye. those opposed? Paper passes. Also offered by um, Member McLaughlin, status of outstanding reports. Right. So this had also been one, our first school committee meeting as a, a new member had the list of requested reports, our second did not have them on the agenda anymore. And then I was curious about what that was and um, where the status of the outstanding reports are. But since this topic is being moved to the um, uh, Rules, Policy, and Equity Subcommittee, of which I am a member, I am uh, OK with moving this uh, topic there and figuring out how we report to the public on these outstanding reports. So I can just send this to subcommittee. Rules, Policy, and Equity Subcommittee. That's all those right. in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Seconded by Ms. Member Mastone. Paper passes. Be resolved. The Medford School Committee expressed its sincere condolences to the family of Captain Herbert Red Hanlon. Captain Hanlon was a retired Medford police captain who worked closely for many years with the school department, helping to administer the Saving Lives Traffic Safety Grant. Also, be it resolved that the Medford School Committee express its sincere condolences to the family of Robert Buckley. Mr. Buckley was the brother of Medford High School Administrative Assistant Charlotte Grant. Also, be it resolved that the Medford School Committee express its sincere condolences to the family of Joseph P. Stone. Mr. Stone was the father of Patty Donnelly, special education teacher at the Columbus Elementary School. If we all may rise for a moment of silence. Okay. Negotiations and legal matters? None. None. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Member McLaughlin, seconded by Member Van de Kloot. Have a great night, and we will see you scooping ice cream at the Ice Cream Social on Saturday.